Martin Tobal, and title is Thermal Stress and Financial Distress, which um, is about looking at the effects of uh, temperature extremes on uh, firms' loan default in Mexico. So uh, to start with a nice motivating uh, slide, this graph shows uh, uh, 2,000 years of uh, temperatures of recorded temperatures in in, uh, in the world, and we can see that um, already climate change has advanced uh, approximately 1.1 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, this phenomenon indicates that we are already experiencing an increase in the frequency and severity of extreme weather events, which of course includes uh, heat waves, extreme hot temperatures, but also extreme cold temperatures. So this outlook has uh, increased the concerns of the ability of uh, low, low and middle income economies and especially of small and medium enterprises in this context to uh, handle, uh, manage the potential impacts uh, of this type of um, uh, of this type of extreme events, uh, especially in places where uh, the equipment to cope with this uh, phenomena is scarce and the resources to invest in adaptive uh, technologies are not always available. So we know from past work that extreme weather events affect uh, firms in a myriad of ways. We know that it has uh, above a certain threshold that is defined for, for very specific for different types, types of crops, that it has strong agricultural impacts by reducing agricultural yields and though the incomes uh, of, the, of agricultural firms. On the other hand, we know that it can create discomfort, fatigue, even difficulty thinking or doing cognitive tasks. Uh, and this has an impact on the labor costs of firms through reductions in labor supply, through hours work, there, there's a reduction in productivity as well. Uh, there's an ideal temperature for, for physical and mental work. And beyond that very specific uh, uh, ideal conditions, productivity goes down. Uh, so this reflects also on, on absenteeism. There is work uh, currently ongoing, exploring uh, the perspective on the global disutility of labor in a warming world. So firms uh, have to deal with these costs uh, as well. Even for firms that are able to take adaptive measures to deal with these uh, reductions in productivity and in demand, these uh, adaptation measures are costly. Uh, so there is also something that firms have to deal uh, higher, uh, some sort of uh, increased irrigation or indoor climate control to avoid these productivity effects. Um, and finally, we know that uh, services and behavior, uh, demand for services, sorry, and behavior also responds to weather. So there is a reduction in, in demand and in time use. There's a change in time use patterns once we get out of the comfort zone. Uh, so this can also reflect on local demand for a, a wide variety uh, of service. And all of this, even in firms that are not directly affected, and we're going to try to also uh, speak to this with our, with, our, with our research, can have effects on other types of firms that we consider less exposed through uh, effects in local demand and through some local general equilibrium effects that I hope to show you some uh, suggestive evidence that this is, that is, is happening uh, in Mexico. So all of this, uh, with all of these channels, uh, extreme weather can become an income shock for firms that can create liquidity shortages for them in the in the short run. This can turn into solvency problems uh, and increase credit delinquency and perhaps even putting survival of the firms at risk if the problem is large uh, enough. This problem is more likely to be large enough for small and medium enterprises in low and middle income countries, which is why we look at this uh, question for the case of Mexico. And I will show you that it's actually small firms uh, that are the most affected by weather shocks. Um, why are they more affected? As, as, as I hinted before, they do not, do not have uh, much access to credit that could perhaps enable them to cope 
with this uh, type of, uh, well, well, any with any shock, but in particular with one that is triggered like the by the uh, weather shock that we're looking at, and uh, in general, small and uh, small and medium firms have even greater problems accessing credit in low and in low and middle income economies. So this is. Um, my colleagues are more the financial stability colleagues, and I am more the environmental person in the group. So I generally present this, this work to uh, a more environmental crowd for which uh, it's, uh, it's interesting or it's, it's important to, to discuss why, why do we care about uh, credit defaults and why are these particularly interesting. In the first place, uh, we have uh, for firm level data, on income and an output that is high frequency is generally scarce. So our de dependent uh, variable that allows to see firms every quarter and see how they're managing uh, this shock every quarter gives us, uh, it's an, represents an advancement in the literature also because of the high frequency uh, nature of the data that allows us to look at, very, at the very short run impacts of these type uh, of shocks. Second, as we know, defaults can hinder future access to credit and growth and recent work on other types of uh, rainfall shocks in Colombia, for example, they have found that uh, this indeed, even though after firms uh, for a transitory shock can have uh, long run effects and we don't know a lot of a lot of why this uh, lasting nature of the impacts, uh, productivity and growth impacts on firms from transitory shock. So we think that what we're that what we're seeing that um, the results that we find in terms of default and credit management could give us a hint on some of the mechanisms beside behind these more persisting uh, effects of transitory transitory weather shocks that have been found uh, in the literature. And finally, uh, default rates are the variable of interest on regulators when they're trying to uh, design uh, policies to protect the financial, the stability of the of the financial uh, system. And we want to highlight uh, by thinking about our results, a tension between uh, protecting the the stability uh, of the of the system by incorporating some considerations of the risk, the increased risk uh, that will only increase more in time uh, of loans that are environmentally uh, sensitive and the ability of the system to grant loans and providing access to credit to these vulnerable firms, which one could argue might be the ones who actually need it the most. To, um, to adapt to, to maybe uh, invest to change their technology. Are you considering also this aspect of transition to a new, a new, a new technologies? And... So in our results, uh, the adaptation component, econometrically speaking, would be absorbed by the by the fixed effects, which we don't uh, we don't interpret them. Um, might be nice to look at the actual coefficients, uh, um, but what we are actually doing is isolating this adaptation component and just looking at the part to which they are not adapted to kind of quantify that that part of the of the effect. So what we do is looking at the effects of extreme temperature on credit delinquency in Mexico especially in small and middle enterprises, trying to answer these two uh, interrelated research questions. So we were wondering if firms default more on their credits when they uh, face this type of uh, temperature shock, or are they being able to rely on credits uh, to cope with the shock? Um, to answer these questions, we exploit this uh, very detailed data set with loan level information for the universe uh, of loan extended by commercial banks uh, and firms in Mexico. 
uh, for nine years. And then we construct uh, quarterly county level delinquency rates and other uh, credit outcomes. And then uh, we relate them to uh, the temperature during that quarter in that uh, county. I will show you a little bit more about that. So obviously our identification strategy relies on the, on the assumption that these weather shocks are exogenous, that they come to firms rather as a surprise. We're hoping that with all the fixed effects, we're able to parse out all the seasonal nature of some of these shocks and some of the adaptation that has already happened uh, for many of, of these firms. So just to give you a brief preview uh, of the results, we find that credits, uh, that extreme temperatures increase delinquency for small, small and medium enterprises. I will now say SMEs, uh, but not for large firms. Um, this makes sense because we know that these type of firms have uh, lack are more lacking in terms of risk managed uh, uh, strategies and equipment and protective measures to be able to mitigate uh, this shock. And that they find, and that we know that also that they find it more difficult to actually access a uh, credit to cope with shocks in general. Uh, we will show you that they do not uh, get credit when they face a, a weather shock either. We also find that most of our results are driven by, by days of extreme heat and not by trace, but days of extreme cold. Um, in other contexts, they find that extreme cold also has like a general aggregate effect. In Mexico, we find this because Mexico in general is a hot country. So um, there are some physical uh, boundaries for agriculture, for the body to keep uh, homeostasis uh, that, it, that are like objective thresholds. So once we go above that threshold, uh, we start to getting in trouble. So in Mexico, our problem is getting more closer to the hot thresholds and not to the cold uh, thresholds. Uh, some of these are 34 degrees for agriculture, 33 Celsius for productivity, 37 for supplies, 32 degrees Celsius for outdoor leisure. So those are the thresholds that we are navigating uh, in, the, in the case of Mexico. Climate change will also increase uh, the frequency of extreme cold events, but uh, the average minimum temperatures in Mexico, that is uh, three degrees Celsius, is not so uh, dangerous in terms of, for example, the health effects or uh, the most dire effects of, of, of cold for health, for example. And it's uh, the relevant thresholds will be 10 degrees for leisure, four degrees for productivity. Uh, for, sorry, for electricity consumption. But we don't reach uh, health, agriculture, and labor supply. Our results, uh, as I hinted before, are driven by non-performing loans. This is where events increase the defaults, but people, uh, firms are not uh, asking, or they're at least they're not obtaining uh, more, more loans to weather the income shock that is implicit in this, in this weather shock. This is consistent with other findings uh, related to SMEs having difficulty to obtain these types of uh, shocks to weather, I'm sorry, credit to weather shocks, but it, it is in contrast uh, with has, what has been found where they, in the US, where they have found that uh, firms do obtain, uh, they increase uh, their, their credit balance when they face um, when they face weather shocks. So this also highlights the importance of doing this uh, type of work in different contexts with different financial system because firms are clearly facing different challenges and they have different tools when uh, navigating this, this phenomenon. We find that the effects are larger for agriculture. Uh, this makes sense. This is the most established uh, strands uh, of the literature, temperature is often modeled as a direct input of the agricultural production uh, process. But interestingly, we also find a statistically significant impact on non-agricultural firms. So no non-agro firms are also defaulting uh, these shocks. There are some mechanisms that are common to uh, all of uh, the industries, but then we look at some heterogeneity 
in the non-agricultural firms to see who is being more affected, to see if we can shed light on other mechanisms of this impact. And we find that this effect is concentrated in non-tradable industries that's, that is more reliant on local demand and local economic activity in regions that are more dependent uh, on agriculture. When we look at the non-agricultural sector, we do find, uh, we also find uh, that uh, extreme cold affects non-tradable industries. And we hypothesize uh, that this has to do with the, the behavioral aspect of the behavioral responses uh, to temperature. For example, some of the activities in this non-tradable sector uh, are related to recreation, dining, and shopping, and other things that are uh, vulnerable to this kind of behavioral responses to extreme cold. So I hope, uh, in the interest of time, I hope that I, I kind of convinced you to uh, of the that there are some valuable contributions of this uh, paper. We will, I will deepen a little bit on these arguments, just to uh, say the bottom line, we are the first evidence of the impact of extreme temperature on this type of credit variable and delinquency rates. And also there is very scarce uh, literature on uh, low and middle income, income countries. I think there's only uh, the, from these papers mentioned here, there's only one, Okay, not, not working. There's only one uh, that is in Philippines. So the rest have to do with uh, with developed countries, and we focus on the on SMEs. For this for for this strategy, we use a proprietary data set from uh, the Bank of Mexico, where my co-authors work, containing very detailed information of loans granted to private commercial banks uh, by private commercial banks. Sorry, uh, we observe the location. Uh, of the of the loan or the firm in terms of the Mexican county where it, where it is located. We know the industry of the firm, its size. Size is measured in terms of the largest loan that it has uh, ever gotten um, and whether the current loan is defaulted, this is not performing or not. Like I said, then we get like a county quarterly level uh, data sets that we link to our weather data. Uh, we use the DAMET database, which exists only for North America. Uh, this uh, recent work has shed light on how compared to other satellite-based uh, temperature uh, sets, ERA-5 uh, like ERA or CHIRPS for, for precipitation, this one performs the best uh, in terms of uh, geographical granularity. It has a one kilometer times one kilometer uh, grid and it contains minimum and maximum temperatures and it has uh, very good precision even at this very small one kilometer grid. Although we are not using the one kilometer grid, what we are using is taking at the county level. So for each county, we are kind of tracing the, the boundaries of the county with, with the grid and obtaining the average from all the um, cells that are, or the pixels that are uh, inside uh, that county. And this, this data set is daily. So then when we aggregate at the quarterly level that is that matches our credit outcomes, then our variable of interest is going to be the days within that quarter of extreme heat or extreme cold that the firms uh, faced. This, this, uh, how do we define extreme heat and extreme cold? We use it uh, with, the, with the distribution. This is, we use relative, uh, thresholds with respect to the distribution. So we take uh, extreme as above and below the 95 and 5th percentiles uh, respectively of the national distribution, which corresponds to three degrees and 36 uh, degrees Celsius. I will show you later, of course, that this is robust to changing the threshold, to changing maximum and minimum for average, to doing all sorts of things just to make sure that it's not like we just cherry pick the best uh, specification. We do so many tests uh, that I will fly over at some point. I will skip this. So once we um, 
incorporate the fixed effects into our uh, specification. What we're actually measuring is the days, uh, it's not the effect of the total days of extreme heat or the total days of extreme cold, but the anomalous days of extreme heat and extreme cold once we have absorbed all, all that the fixed effects uh, can, uh, can, all the seasonality and uh, and the long run trends that the fixed effects can grab. So this is our main specification. Our variable, our dependent variable is the delinquency rate in county M, quarter Q, and year Y. And we put in there the days of extreme heat during that period of time, the days of extreme cold, and a battery of fixed effects county by quarter, quarter by year, county by year. We also control for average uh, precipitation to kind of uh, parse out the part of the crop effect that comes from, uh, from rain. And the dependent variable, of course, is, is measured as non-performing loans over the total uh, balance that the, that the firms have. So yes. A question. Uh, I mean, I, I would expect that the uh, effect of uh, these extreme weather is not contemporaneous in the sense that uh, firms have uh, buffers, uh, I guess, of liquidity and they can withstand. So, so maybe some delayed uh, or lagged effect of extreme weather on delinquency is what one would expect. Um, but I can see here that you're doing the contemporaneous uh, kind of effect, right? Yes, we do. Uh, we do use a specification with lags. And I was actually surprised that the largest effect uh, is a contemporaneous effect. So the lags are, when we include the lags, they only make the contemporaneous effect more precise. Uh, so we do that even. Um, is the percentage of non-performing loans over the total balance that of the firm. Yes. Mm. Yeah, maybe it's in, like ingrained in the definition. I need to I need to think about it, but yeah. So to jump into into the results, uh, we find that uh, the effect is driven is. 0.012 effect is driven by what is happening with small and medium uh, enterprises. Although our definition of small and medium enterprises is that their largest credit is less than 10 million pesos. So we know that this is a little bit uh, lax for a definition of small firms, and we are working on matching it uh, with to know the size of a firm in terms of work. So we hope to, to be able to provide a more granular definition of small firms uh, in the future. Yes? What we can see is the location um, that they gave to the to the bank that is giving them the loan. So of course that it, that could be also a reason why we're not seeing anything for large firms. There are much more measurement error that they give the the address of the headquarters uh, and, and something like that. So it's difficult. Uh, some of them do. So some of them have to ask for the local bank, I believe, but some of them don't. So then I'm not sure. Sorry, what? You know, I'm sure. We have no because we have loan level uh, information. So for that loan, we know the I, the firm uh, industry, uh, the firm uh, the characteristics of the loan, and then when we that's why when we use the um, when we classify them between small and large, we're using more information on loans to see like what is the size uh, in terms of the loans. That they that they have uh, received, but for example, adding to his question, do you have the ID of the firm, like for example, the fiscal ID of the firm, even even though it's at the loan level, the credit registry, because if you have it and you have this location because of the branch of the banks, you could uh, identify if a firm has a network uh, throughout the territory, and that and, and it's the same firm, you know, so. At the yes. same moment, having different different loans at different branches, so then you have a measure of how spread 
how many branches that firm has, and it's another, another measure of size. You probably have it because we also have a trade registry at the loan level, and we have the the exactly the 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 fiscal ID of the of the borrower. Yes, I do not have access to the central bank data. I just get the I just get the more processed, anonymized process data set. Uh, but I think that perhaps my friends at the Your, bank the financial can, go stability, through, yes. can go through the process to get uh, this type of this type of information. Uh, could, could I could I come back to to a sure. point about contemporary and uh, HE of the in fact, I believe that um, the, there is some uh, persistence in the in the in the extreme temperature events, and uh, maybe it would be interesting to look at the lengths of the heat waves. Let's say, so if you if you have uh, one a high, high temperature event uh, every two weeks, it's not a big deal. But if you have a series, I mean, something that uh, you see what I mean—a heat wave for two weeks—that's a lot. I will show you that we do have a graph to type to try to look at the nonlinearity depending on the length of the um yeah of the spell. Uh, it doesn't look super nonlinear, but I will show you and leave it to you to decide whether this constitutes nonlinear uh, effects. Okay, we are almost there. Um, so our, our effects are driven by days of extreme heat and non, not by days of extreme cold, which is what uh, we find here. Uh, just to give you a sense of the magnitude of the, of the impact that we are finding, uh, our data is quarterly. So it will imply that 10 unusually hot days uh, within a quarter would uh, entail an increase of 8% uh, in default rates with respect to the sample mean. We look, like I said, we wanted to see if they're, how they're managing this, if they are defaulting or they're asking uh, or trying to get uh, more, more credit to kind of deal with, with, the, with the implicit income shock and we find nothing, no effects in, in the total balance of performing loans and we just see uh, this type of uh, a share of it going to to default. We find more effects to firms that are non-agricultural only if they are in high uh, or extreme heat only if they are in highly agricultural regions, like I like I said before, and for uh, for firms that are non-agricultural and that they're located in low agricultural regions, we find uh, this behave what we hypothesize is the eff behavioral effect uh, of days in, in extreme of extreme cold. Um, so our definition of agricultural regions, it's worth uh, noting, is counties uh, with an above median share of the working population. Uh, in agricultural, so we think that these uh, that these effects that we are finding in the right of the of, of the table are consistent with uh, indirect impacts on other sectors in this type of regions that reduce local income and demand. So we think that this is a suggestive evidence of uh, local general equilibrium effects. Yes. Can you explain why crop and off we could, we actually, yeah, I got this comment yesterday and I agree that we should uh, exploit, uh, exploit the calendar. And uh, I also got an interesting comment that since we have the, this very detailed grid, we could also overlay it with uh, cropping maps to get crop relevant, more crop relevant shocks, which I also find uh, very interesting. Um, So when we further uh, disentangle these, these effects, like I said, they're focused on non-tradables, which are more, uh, uh, more reliant on, on local demand. 
like retail, recreation, etc. Uh, so they and they do not these type of uh, enterprises tend to not, not market uh, beyond their territory. So they will be for uh, non-agricultural the subsector that we will expect to have the most vulnerability uh, for this type of shocks for heat and even for cold, which we also uh, find. So just to answer some of your uh, questions with the with respect to the empirical stuff. Ah, yes, uh, we, we use all of these robustness checks. We use different thresholds for the definition of minimum and maximum temperature. Of course, the absolute most uh, lenient and the most demanding type of threshold, we, we will get less precision for different reasons, but among the uh, intermediate specifications, our, our results uh, are robust and quite stable. We also uh, use county-specific percentiles instead of national percentiles, and it doesn't change uh, our, our results qualitatively. I don't know why we can see this slide correctly, but uh, we use also average temperature instead of max and mean. Uh, we also, ah, here's what is what I'm answering your question about the, the non-linearity. Uh, when we separate the length of the, of the, of the shock, we do find that, that the more than 20 days is what is bringing uh, the highest impacts and the, the shape of this graph is kind of uh, ascending, uh, suggesting a little bit of non-linearity, but all the CIs intersect, so I wouldn't uh, die in that hill of non-linearity. We also look at the dynamic effects, and uh, we find that, uh, like I said, that adding the lags just makes the co contemporaneous shock uh, the coefficient more precise. And just to conclude, with the three minutes that I that I have uh, left, we we have thought about some of the for the policy implications uh, of this. So, extreme temperatures in increase the delinquency rate of of SMEs. These temporary shocks can have long-run impacts if firms cannot gain access to credit after they're, they're defaulting uh, their loans. We do not find an increase in, uh, in total credit, so their firms are not being able to cope uh, by acquiring uh, loans. And this, we place these results uh, in this debate that I mentioned at, at the beginning of, of the presentation of what is the regulatory agenda uh, for climate risk, for climate risks. Uh, so, for example, we could think about how to protect banks uh, from from this and 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 in implementing regulatory measures that can help them uh, internalize uh, this this risk, such as uh, the inclusion of higher uh, risk weights in capital requirements when they're dealing with this type of. Uh, environmentally risky uh, loans, uh, but, on, but on the other hand, um, this can aggravate uh, the access of, of SMEs uh, to credit. So perhaps it is, it is interesting to think about uh, the role of insurance, which we uh, would expect to, have a, uh, to be important, especially for, for agricultural firms. And it's also, uh, it will also be relevant to think about uh, some some sort of a disaster related deferment plan so those type of measures that could uh, help the most vulnerable firms while thinking of a way of also protecting the stability of the system and i think that i conclude with that thank you so much uh, for your attention thank you sandra a very well managed time uh, i let's open the 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 space for Questions. I, I have a question regarding the data and maybe a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Since you have this uh, credit registry data, I, I, I'm guessing because I think Mexico has, has that data, uh, you could also add the information on collaterals, especially for the agricultural uh, sector, because although they are SMEs, some of these firms uh, have their their loans uh, backed by by the crops, or so you have another channel, not not just the the performance of the of the loan, but the the quality of the collateral. So maybe you could add also that dimension. Thank you. Sir.
Thank you very much for this very interesting paper and presentation. Uh, and regarding this, this point, the, the policy implications, uh, you mentioned that your results are um, not exactly the same than the results that you find for the US. I, I, I understand that. And, and maybe going deeper into the into the what drives the results could explain or could give some explanation about uh, what policy implication, what is behind, no? Uh, for example, I, I am curious about the role of insurance that uh, uh, Cecilia mentioned collateral, but also insurance, agricultural insurance, and the use of, of this uh, financial instrument to cover the risk. Uh, maybe it's different in the US than in Mexico. I am curious about that. Yes, well, the results for the, for the US are qualitatively different because they, in the US firms, when they have this type of, of weather shocks, Although I think that they prefer is on snow, but they 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 are able to get a loan uh, to to get uh, and to deal with this liquidity uh, shortage, and uh, etc. So um, in terms of uh, insurance, it is my understanding that many insurance uh, mechanisms for crops are more centered on precipitation. Uh, it's like if rainfall goes below or above certain threshold, then it triggers uh, this insurance uh, mechanism. So I, I, it will, uh, yeah, perhaps for the for the relevance, we can look at what percentage of these uh, crop insurance mechanism actually incorporate extreme extreme heat and extreme cold to see if maybe they're we're missing this part of the risk. And maybe small firms have no access to that, uh, that yeah. insurance. Yeah, that's also that the explain. matter of access of insurance that I believe that it's not as common in Mexico to insure your crops as in other, even in other developing countries. It is my understanding. Uh, Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you have some information regarding how banks are responding to this increase in non-performing loans and whether you can explore. I know you have the contemporaneous effect on granting of credits, but maybe a heat wave today can, can affect the access to credit, let's say, two years because banks don't want to be exposed to those. Temperatures. Definitely. We, we, um, we do think that that is an next step for this paper, uh, because it's part of the it's part of the hypothesis, right? This give, it gives it more uh, um, furthers the argument of the relevance if the firms if we show that even in this sample we know this for other contexts, but that also in this context they can't uh, access more credits afterwards. Uh, Super interesting, very, very, uh, very nice paper. Um, in the spirit of understanding a bit more the, the spillover effect that you might have mm -hmm. from this um, uh, temperature risk. So, and that goes a bit to the same point as that. So I wonder if, so you have this effect on local non-traded goods or non-traded industry. So it can come from the demand side. So there is, uh, you know, the area is heat and so the demand for credit goes down. Or it could come from the credit supply side. So uh, you could aggregate your um, your credit risk at the bank level mm -hmm. uh, and um, and estimate whether uh, effectively the uh, lending of the bank so uh, is affected. So the supply of credit is affected by uh, by this risk and to which particular market segment is. Uh, Cutting credit or not? I mean, so whether the bank and and that means that you know there would be a contagion channel going through banks. Uh, the ones which are hardest hit might might be lending in specific areas, or there could be some contagion going from you know one area to another area. It would be interesting to explore that in in more detail. I think to me, you can do it. It's just a matter of aggregating essentially the shocks and es estimating the shocks. Uh, it's like uh, you know at, at the at the bank level. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Exposure from different uh, locations, but that aggregated at the bank level. Yeah, it could also be quite interesting to see 
crypto virus is allowed. From a financial stability point of view, essentially, that would be the thing you would want to know. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, this is connected. Uh, I mean, if, if if you want to think about the policy implications of these results, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, policy has to be based on some observables, right? And uh, so if, if these uh, uh, weather shocks are serially correlated uh, in the sense that uh, if you have a particular incidence of bad weather in one region today, and three months later, you still have that, you can base your capital surcharges on whatever you have observed uh, in the last year, say, or something like that. So, so examining the, the correlation of, of these weather shocks uh, seems to me uh, important in order to think about ways of incorporating these risks into their uh, regulatory framework. I mean, if, if, if they are sort of dispersed and uh, sort of uh, with little correlation across time, then today is here, tomorrow is there, then, I mean, it's, it's sort of... Uh, more difficult to think about the uh, way of uh, incorporating these sort of uh, weather events into the into the capital regulation. Say, yeah, I mean, we're we're hoping that the with with all our our uh, SFX structure and so on, we're kind of uh, absorbing some of these some places being more likely to have uh, more weather shocks and so on. The thing with climate change is that this is changing over time and it is sometimes hard to forecast in the very short run what areas are going to be hit more with this kind of increase uh, anomalies that not even uh, in the climate models, the climate into weather models, they're being able to fully uh, kind of characterize how these how this shocks are going uh, to look. So it's it's, it's kind of hard, but we do make the point that uh, by looking at who is affected, uh, maybe why we can't say that much about uh, the, the side that you're asking, but we can identify uh, types of environmentally risky loans or sectors that are more affected or the, or, or regions that clearly default more when they when they face this this type of shock. So maybe it could go on that side uh, of the um, of the forecasting or the, the risk consideration. Yes. Thank you for interesting presentations. So if, if, if my reading is correct, so what I know from the banking literature is that in general, there is evidence that these SMEs are perceived as being riskier. So usually they have hard time in accessing finance compared with a large mm -hmm. firm. So on top of this, you show that there is a new dimension, this exposure to uh, the, the high temperature that makes them even more riskier. I think it would be interesting from those along, uh, along uh, what was suggested before, to try to understand a little bit more which type of SME suffer more. For example, I expect those that are in long-term relationship with certain banks, so this is again about the supply of banking services, mm. will suffer less. So I think this is a dim dimension that can be explored a little bit further. Yes, and also you could you Thank could you. like overlap all the dimensions. For example, firms with only one uh, bank relationship versus firms with more than one, uh, plus the region, plus the sector, the industry to which they belong. So you have a, a lot of dimensions of exposure at the bank and at the firm level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Well, we, we try to tackle some of, some of these dimensions, but yeah, perhaps looking at uh, there's definitely. Uh, more than can be done from the uh, bank or relationship with the bank uh, uh, level um, analysis, definitely. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, No, that, that's fine. Wait for the slides to be okay.
So thank you and welcome, Bernardo. The floor is yours. Uh, uh, so first, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure. Um, so I'm going to present the paper, uh, Bank's Fiscal Footprint and Financial Technology Adoption. Uh, that's trying to work with Lucas, who's here, or Shizé Renata from the Central Bank of Brazil. Uh, and I have to say this disclaimer that the views are not from the, the Central Bank of Brazil. Um, so the context of this presentation is, you no, know, recently we have a um, you know, recent expansion of new financial technologies, um, and in particular digital payment methods worldwide. Um, we also have like the entry of new players, but we call them usually fintechs. And at the same time, banking in general, like the provision of banking services moving from like, uh, you know, brick and mortar branch based model, like towards an increasingly digital model. So here, just to have a, you know, like a number, which is, I don't know in Uruguay, but it's quite common. Uh, I should have checked in Uruguay, but it's quite common across the world that, that I mean, in the recent years, Brazil lost like 5,000 branches in Brazil, like, like, like 22% reduction. So that's, you know, branches are disappearing. Um, so the questions that we try to answer in this paper are, so how the, so how the, the presence of brick and mortar branches, they shape the technologies that are used in their vicinity. <clears throat> and also how this, you know, the fact that they shape the technologies or the payment methods, for example, using their proximity, how does this, uh, how can this affect the penetration of these new entrants like fintechs, banks that only create digital banks, et cetera. And they're gonna pay particular attention to a new payment technology called PIX that I'm gonna explain. <laughs> we're gonna use data on this technology. Um, so the link between branches and, and payment technologies, right? So I keep, we know, you know the key function of banks is the provision of, of payment service, right? So banks uh, store and distribute currency, Right, but they also you know issue them on the post, spread and the cards, they clear checks, uh, they perform credit transfers. So that's that's a key function of banks, right? And in particular, bank branches, right? They can influence the payment technologies using their vicinity, right? In particular, cash because they lower costs to withdraw and to withdraw and to deposit cash, right? So banks you know, provide they provide a bunch of payment service, but they they also you know facilitate the use of cash, fiscal branches. Uh, so then fiscal branches can in induce the locality to rely more on cash, right? Even when new potentially welfare enhancing technologies become available, right? So why uh, the reason that, you know, these markets for payments, uh, they are like two-sided markets, right? So we have adoption complementarities and network externalities. So the value of, uh, of a method, right? Depends on other people are adopting the method, right? So there's this externality that can prevent the spread of new new technologies. Um, that there is also like lack of trust in some new technologies, like learning costs, informational barriers, organizational constraints, like habit formation. So that could be all of this can make banks like shape the use of you know, influence or, or promote the use of cash, even when new, potentially better <clears throat> payment methods become available, right? And such a reliance on cash, right? The fact that that locality relies out on cash, right? Can, can be sort of a barrier, right? To institutions that only operate digitally, that they, they don't have the infrastructure, right? The fiscal infrastructure to support cash transactions, like a bank, a digital bank or a fintech, they don't have ATMs, right? So that if that particular locality, right, relies on cash, this could prevent their, you know, the penetration in that market. Sure. Banks like grocery stores? Very, very few. Yeah, so most of the ATMs are actually inside branches for security reasons, actually. So it's not like in Europe that you see like ATMs and the streets, etc. So most of them are safe locality because of prime, et cetera. So 
but there are some. But adding to that, do you have agencies, not, not for example, a, a supermarket or a store, but for example, alternative agencies that uh, do these services that provide they, they, these kind of yeah. services? So I, the network is, yeah. is wider than the one from yeah, the past. Yeah, it's wider. Yeah, it's wider. For sure. There are items in groceries, grocery store, but it's, um, especially in small localities, the role of branches and ATMs inside those branches is, is important. Um, so that's it. So because of these complementarities uh, and you know all the costs, the, the, it's not easy for new technologies to spread. Um, so the, and then so the challenge that for our research question is so why not, so why the uh, we need to look to explore right changes in the network of branches right in the branch network and in, you know in general this reflects the bank's decision so for example you know, banks might close branches right in place where the population is adopting diesel methods right so if you try to measure this effect right in those localities it's going to be confounded by this you know, previous trend so what we're going to do it which is going to be it's unusual from it's we're going to explore uh, some robbery rates in Brazil that are very common, but that they use explosives, right? So they basically destroy the branch for a while, right? <laughs> they are performed by non-local criminal groups. They are like a sophisticated, sophisticated operation. They go to a small municipality, they explode the branch to access the cash of the branch, and then they flee right away, right? And of course, they are unlikely to coincide with, you know, for example, demand shocks, uh, surge in consumption, et cetera, that could also affect the adoption of new technologies. So we're gonna use high frequency data, like weekly or monthly, with a measure control group to try to answer our, our question. Uh, so the, the some of the findings, like so the sudden and temporary interruption of branch service need, uh, Leads to a sizable reduction in branches cash inventory. The cash event after the, those events, the cash inventory in, the, in that branch drops by to zero by two, <clears throat> for a couple of months. Right? We don't observe no short-term effects on, on loans and deposits, right? but we're going to observe a huge increase in the adoption of new technology, digital technology, right? And Something that we find very interesting, we find that after those events, <clears throat> people start to using more fintechs and digital banks, payment institutions. So, so now once people don't can, don't need to rely a lot, once people adopt a digital digital technology, it's easier for them, makes more sense to move from a traditional bank to a digital bank. Right. So this could have like competition effects. Um uh, we're going to see, like, we're going to document adoption, heterogeneity in adoption, and spillovers to transactions that are also not likely to be carried out by cash in the first place. Um, yeah, so that's uh, we are sure a new factor that shapes the, the use of, of, of digital payment technologies. Um, it's relevant, as I said, because of this, there's a sharp contraction in the physical footprint, footprint of banks, and there is a I'm not citing the papers here because like there are many papers there is there are like many papers showing positive effects of digital technologies on you know risk sharing, um, right like access, business growth, etc. Right. Um, we document this spill over to digital financial institutions, so probably because they have better IT capabilities or better capabilities to provide digital payment services. So. Yeah, so in a sense, the fact that the locality relies a lot on cash has this negative side that could prevent, could be a barrier to the penetration of digital institutions, right? But on the positive side, we know that there is a digital divide. <clears throat> so using cash is still important for especially poor or less educated individuals. So there is, we have these two sides here. Uh, like, like, a, like, you know, reliance on cash can, can be like a barrier to digital institutions, but on the other hand, they, they're still important to a relatively, you know, to, to an important part of the population. Uh, so that's so moving to, to the paper. So that just again, the in, the banking and payment industry in Brazil is, is concentrated. So that's that's why we're you know, talking about this competition, potential competition effects. Uh, it's surprisingly, you know, uh, people do use digital methods in, in Brazil. It's like it's like a large penetration of digital methods. 
But cache remains relevant, right? I'm going to show a bit more, more data on that later. Um, we're going to, yeah. Uh, yeah, so Pixel was, was launched in the end of 2010, November 2010. 2020, sorry, November 2020. Yeah, yeah, November 2020. So it's the end, end, very end of that. Very end. No, very end, it's the very end. Uh, so November 2020. Yeah. Very little. Uh, very little. So these are credit, uh, credit cards. Um, so then, uh, yeah, I'm going to focus on this new payment technology, which is was launched in November 2020, it's called PIX. Uh, it's available 24 7 to individuals, business, and governments. There is mandatory participation of banks, there is inter interoperability. It's alias based, so it's very simple to carry out the transaction. You don't need like a key. There's no need to, you know, to insert like the lengthy account, account in details. It's, it's free of charge to individuals, right? You don't need an account in a bank or payment institution, right? So here is like, you see that it's very simple. Here is an example in Brazil. You see that you can just use the QR, QR code and you can carry out the payment or a key, right? You see. Right. So that's, that's a, that was a huge success. So that's like around $1 trillion per year. Um, it's mostly like person to person transactions. Um, and so one year after it's, it's launched, right? So around 54% of the population use, use the method at least once. Um, so that's 90, 96 million individuals. So it's 54% of the adult population, but it's still, so around 7 to 1 million individuals in Brazil during this period. So 40% so of the adult population do not, did not use any digital method. So they rely on cash. That's a, that's, it's a huge success, but that is still you know, a less mile here to, Run to, to go right there's 40 percent of the adult so they are shocked so since 2010 or criminal organizations that have targeted have been targeting this place in small and medium municipalities so they basically try to access all the currency stored in the safe and atm of the branch using explosives so they go there but they are not local they go to municipality to 5,000 inhabitants they try to explode the branch and they flee straight away they take the highway and they so it's a very sophisticated type of crime. So they require like skilled personnel, expensive equipment. So they are not local. They not they are not performed by local, you know, criminals. They are like you know um, organized crime that they are. I'm gonna go to like very small municipality, explode the branch, try to get the cash, and flee like 20 minutes after the explosion. So that's good for us in terms of so as I said, <laughs> so the branch networks are endogenous, right? So it's this could. No, it's a temporary shock that affects the, the function of the branches, right? And we show that there is no relation. So it's, it's truly like, I mean, we believe it's like the good exogenous shock in the sense that we also show that there is no effects on other crimes, local crimes. It's just that thing in the middle of the night, in the dead of night, they go explore, they leave, people wake up, there is a, the branch is not, no longer there. So they, that's it. But there is no, it's not like during the day. It's like in the middle of the night, they go explore, they leave, People wake up, there's no more branch. <laughs> so the, here is an example that you see the, you know, the, the banks do become destroyed. So as I said, so if people was, you know, went to bed, they woke, woke up, the branch disappeared for a couple of months. Usually they reopen after a couple of months. Right? So here's an example, you know, Banco in, in Minas Gerais. See that the bank becomes, they need to, the bank is not the branch is not op 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 operable for a couple of months, right? So that's a, I'm going to use this shock. This like you know, when I use like a, uh, the shock, uh, uh, we're gonna you know perform like a matching to you know to match control and treatment municipalities just to, 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 to but it's not so important. And we're gonna do like a, a, you know a difference in difference with you know with as I said like, like an event study right because we have like weekly data we're gonna see one week after the event what's happening to this technology so it's like a, an event study with, with a control group right so it's a difference in difference with so the robbery yeah so the robbery and then we're gonna see what happens in that municipality when they wake wake up and there is no branch anymore. <laughs> So we're gonna 
it's nice because again we can control for time trends blah blah you have like all the you know the, the shock is nice that we can have a control group we can control for municipality uh, effects like bank time fixed effects we can control for trends like you know uh, that depend on, on the internet coverage in the municipality so it's it's, it's a pretty beautiful design right so here is the first result right so the after these events, right? So nothing happens to landing in that in those branches, right? The policy said it's like a small effect, but the cash, the fiscal cash is stored in that branch drops to zero, basically. So the branch cannot don't doesn't have any cash no, Right. So they cannot, people cannot go there and withdraw money. They cannot be on the policy because the ATM is destroyed, the safe is destroyed. Right. So the, the branch disappears. The, the cash in that branch disappears, right? The stock of landing, this is, this is not the flow, by the way. So this is stock of landing and stock of deposit. So it's, you know, we have like electronic uh, deposit. So they, they remain there, but the cash inside that branch, so, so it appears. Um, and we also find some spillover spirits that were not destroyed within the same municipality. So probably people are like, that have multiple accounts, they go to the, other, to the branch of the other bank, try to, so the, the cash of the other bank, drops a little bit, but not as dramatic. Uh, so we are using, because we have many zeros, there is this hip, uh, inverse hyperbolic sign transformation. So the, the interpretation of this minus 3.8 is 97%. So the cash drops by 98%. So it dro drops to zero, right, basically, for a couple of months. And here is basically, the, again, the interpretation is you have to, you know, it's the inverse hyperbolic sign because of the zero. So it's so it's basically it drops to zero. So that's interpretation. So here before you see three months after the robbery is nothing, but then we, you know, once the event takes place, the cash drops to zero. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know the question. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, it's not very fun. I keep stopping the bank, uh, but something that we might check the this the magnitude of this. I, I want to check the dates on this, but that's a okay, yeah. But I think they go after the ATMs mostly and they save with the cash, the currency. Yeah, <laughs> they go after the, the currency. Yeah. Uh, but like this again, this is a temporary shock. Right, yeah. When, when a bank is is sort of this, when a branch is destroyed, uh, there are two possible outcomes: the branch is rebuilt uh, after two months, or the branch is permanently closed. Yeah. Do you distinguish between these? The, 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 most of them reopen. Uh, we, we, we that's something that we're going to try to trying to do in the future: try to identify the branch that permanently closed after the event, and some of them do close; they don't reopen again. But most of them reopen like after three, four, five months. So it's a temp it's mostly a temporary shock. They do reopen. But some of them do close. Some of them do close. Uh, we need to work on this to classify. Um, uh, sure. So you save services, that is the people can put, uh, you know. Yeah, that's what it's quite. Yeah. I didn't answer yeah. your question. Okay. That's what it's quite. Yeah. So we believe it's not important. Yeah. But we should get some data on this on the aggregate. Uh, but it's not very common there. People don't put the like, valuables there in the bank. It's not very common. Uh, so here is the peaks, the peaks events, right? So after this, so here is the weekly data, right? So it's uh, again, we could do like an event study, but we are also doing like a match at control group with place that they have to keep the branches, right? Keep the branches um, functioning, right? So after the, the branch disappears temporarily, right? So people start using digital methods. So there is a, you know, um, a spike in the adoption of digital payment methods, which is this fix, right? They don't need cash to perform the next They do using their phones. Um, both in the number, right, of transactions. So that's the first response, but also in the value of total transactions in that municipality, right? Uh, and the facts are relatively, you know, um, it's reduced a bit when you have more branches. So when the shock's smaller. So, uh, you know, if you have two branches and one expo one is exploded, the, the effects a bit smaller right? because people still have the other branch. To, and to after go. the branch is reopened, does the effect uh, the intensity of so, usage of? Yeah, so this so uh, as common in the literature in two-sided markets with you know, network personalities. Uh, 
Well, like a couple of very recent empirical papers, the, the temporary shock becomes persistent. So that's what we show here, right? So here, after the shock, again, the shocks, they, they last for a couple of months, so let's say three months, the branch, the branch reopens, but then they, it's persistent. So once people adopt the technology, right, again, possibly because of you know, network externalities, fix the cause, they keep using this. So the temporary shock has a persistent, a persistent effect on the use of digital technology, right? Here it's like we're just splitting the day, this is weekly, weekly data, right? But you're splitting into non business zeros and business zeros. So we only find the fact for uh, uh, individuals, like using both as pay payers or payees, right? And for business users, only, only when they receive, uh, uh, you know, using this technology, when they receive the money using it. Uh, this is also this is coming other consoles. So uh, Alvarez has a paper using Costa Rica data. He also finds the same thing. So for, for, for firms, they already use digital technologies, other digital technologies for them to well, uh, to pay the suppliers, for example. So, so only when they they get money from their the clients. So this um, yeah. So here is uh, we show that so before peaks like people use debit cards more after the short. Uh, after the peaks, it's also true that they use debit cards, but um, you know most of the effect is is the peaks, right? Because debit cards are a bit costly for for merchants. For example, they have to pay the, the merchant fees, etc. So, but in general, that that's um, we find like it's interesting. Like it's more reduction in credit card usage after the when, when peaks is available, which is uh, a, bit, a bit surprising. Uh, <clears throat> We go. Uh, so that's like intermunicipality transactions now. So now, I mean, this shock, people use cash probably to carry out local transactions. So I'm going to the bakery, I'm going to use cash. But if you, you know, I'm going to send money to a person that's like, you know, 500 minutes away, I, I probably I didn't use cash in the first place, right? So, so in theory, this shock shouldn't affect this type of transaction, like long distance transactions, right? Long distance transactions are not, are not carried out by cash. Then. But we find again still obviously this not to the long distance transaction. So here is like only looking at you know, intermunicipality transaction, right? So after the event, like people started using using peaks, like probably to carry out local transactions, but then they start using this for other types of things, right? So for the um, long distance transactions with us. So there's also this kind of below. And here is the most, I think we find it's the most interesting thing result of the paper is that okay, so. If you have your branch, like you lose your branch, you can still use Pix. All banks have like good internet bank in Brazil. You can still use internet banking of your bank and carry out the transaction usually using your own bank. But then people start using, you find like large effects of people don't, don't do that. I mean, they do that, but they also migrate to digital institutions. So we have, we, we, we document that payment institutions that are digital and non-branch based banks, like they grow in those new spots, right? So they at least measured by peaks by this use of the, the use of this digital payment method. So once you once you lose the reliance on cash, right, we start um, using more digital banks. That, this spillover is something that, that we find find very interesting. That, so that's what uh, as, as we were saying, I was saying in the introduction, right? If you rely a lot on cash, Right, and they're because of this network external, so the, the equilibrium that means part is you know the payment method the equilibrium is like cash, right? Um, it's difficult for digital institutions to penetrate in that market, right? So once people once this equilibrium is, is uh, you know changes or you know move to other payment methods or you know starting using like slowly other payment methods, it becomes easier to like to non branch institutions or digital banks or to Payment institutions to penetrate in that market. In a sense, um, you know, the, the, the reliance on cash is some sort of a buyer, right? To the penetration of digital institutions, they cannot you cannot use additional bank if you need cash. To, I mean, you can use to long distance transactions, blah, 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 but if you still need cash to buy your, you know, buy go to the grocery shop, you, you need to have an account in a traditional bank, right? So this, um, so the payment, the use of payment service, cash can know, be like an impediment or like a buyer to the penetration of these new institutions, right? And we know that they, they could uh, uh, you know, provide like better services or increase competition and 
that's it. So, so um, it's something that we're revising, but we 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 revise this result, but uh, but we we do find, we did find that people start opening accounts in payment institutions after after those events. So you again, and I'm I'm, just, I'm I'm finishing finishing. So the the after those events again, people start like. Um, not only using peaks in other institutions, right? But once you lose the branch, um, again, you can still still use the internet banking of your if your bank of your bank, right? Mobile bank, they all work pretty pretty well. But if you know, but people start migrating open accounts in fintechs, like payments institutions that are, are digital, and these banks are also digital, right? Non branch based and data. so they all only operate digital. It's this spillover once again. Once you don't. Once you don't need to use cash anymore, you start like, okay, maybe I'm going to open an account in a package. Now I can, can do that because now I can, I don't need cash anymore. So, the, yeah, jumping to the conclusion, so we provide the answer to disruption in brand separation, increase the use, use of digital technologies. Um, we show that this, you know, the importance of having like a, a user friendly, cheap technology. Uh, and you document these spillovers to, no, to, to 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 transactions that were not carried by cash carried out in the cash in the first place, and to you know institutions non non affected these institutions. That this these institutions are not affected by the shock, right? Per se, by by the branch expo, uh, destruction of the branch, but, <clears throat> but they have the uh, they increase the penetration after that event in that market in that particular market that that's affected. Um, so that's it. I think it might be tired of time. Thank you, Ricardo. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's open the Facebook questions. Thank you. This is very interesting. Um, I'm going to play here a little bit of devil's advocate. It, it doesn't seem to me necessarily that bank robberies are exogenous because somebody's choosing where, where to go. Can you say a little bit about that and whether that could affect your results or not? So oh, it's it, it, yeah they, they don't flip a coin in general but uh, but I mean we do so, that, so we have this high frequency data right so that's it, it's, it, it has an event stud flavor using high frequency data right so it's uh, you don't see anything happening going on the weeks before that thing uh, we also have the control group right we do show like lots parallel trends as well. So you could do an event study, but we go beyond and do like these control groups. Uh, and we also try to predict the straw potential. It's very hard. So that's, I mean, I'm pretty sure they don't flip a coin, but they, it's, it's a it's high frequency event study nature because like weekly, uh, the week after you see an increasing, but you don't see anything before. It's, I, I think guess. it's very hard to argue that. I mean, we also don't show any effects on other crimes. That's showing that okay, this is not a crime, local crime crime. So this is not like street robbery. You know, like so it's very sophisticated. Organization. It's very expensive for this thing. You need like an specialist in exposure, someone who's highly trained. It's not like you know, in respect of five thousand inhabitants, it's a uh, it's, uh, it's a local local guy is going there. No, it's like sophisticated organization, very sophisticated actually, expensive operation. And they go, they leave in the middle of the night. They don't. So uh, I agree, it's not, but, the, but I think the results are um, showing that there is no trend before, showing the dynamics of the effects, and showing no effects on other crimes, other crimes. But um, I believe it's the it's the central bank that organizes the, the bank robberies to stimulate the use of X. No, that, that's not the, but yeah. I, I, I guess in India, uh, they demonetized something like that a uh, few years ago, and, and this fostered the use of digital means of payment. Yeah, that's stated by, uh, say, like, that's coming at the JP now. It's using the monetization. It's, it's like a shock, right? That lose the, at least to change the equilibrium path or to move to a new equilibrium because of this network, network scenario. And you have work <laughs> these two sided markets, and then the, so it, sometimes you need like a shock to move, depends on the model, but to move from equilibrium to a dollar, right? You need like some perturbation there, which is this kind of the monetization in India, which is a, a Crozet, a Gita, GoPenas, a QG and that as well, showing that once you have this temporary shock, which is also temporary in India, 
people move and it's persistent, right? It's, they don't move back to the previous equilibrium. So that's a, that's a, the similar feature of this. Last one. So I, I think it's a very cool identification. So and, and your paper complements nice the discussion for um, a paper by Ongina and Morales using data from Colombia. They, they focus on robberies and the impact on uh, lending services, showing I that basically the paper. Um, uh, but I, 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 it's a completely different uh, setup. Only this uh, the, this short is, is the same. But I was I was just wondering if you can explore this path. So basically, you focus on payments, which is the novelty and adoption of PIX, but could be like uh, something like peer to peer lending or even via PIX or other platforms, they increase uh, the, the lending small amounts yeah, it's, because it's a kind of effect on the banking services. Yeah. That might have a long term, uh, long term effect. Actually, yeah, this, we tried to do the we, we did the results online. We didn't find any results yet, but uh, you know, when, once they increase peaks, they have, they have they're going to have more hard information about the borrowers. They um, it could it could have effect online, you know, like, uh, and the branch becomes inoperable for twelve months, so the monitoring reduces or soft information that gives a while. But but that would be like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we should we should check that. Uh, but would you check it something? The stock of lending we don't we don't see at, at least for, uh, that six month window we don't find effects. But it it could affect. Uh, um, but at least lending granted by the branches, fiscal branch doesn't change. Maybe we should check lending by the by also the payment institutions, for example. And then that uh, I think we could do that. The, but I have to take the. I will get the paper later. <laughs> the, the, I didn't know about this paper. Sandra and Rafa. In your first see, it looks like the balance of the ATMs like never goes back to the like to the original trend. Like it's not like a shock, and then you have like the. Original balance, it can it kind of uh, stays permanently low. No, no. So this way, we would also be saying that from the branch to reopen, but probably with a smaller cash balance. But they do reopen. Mm -hmm. But probably also because you know, people are using more digital methods, so they need to have cash application. But that is, it's not, and becomes a problem because if people are using digital methods now. They need to have. That branch is more. So but the branch reopen, that's the thing that I mean, you know, the branch should reopen. But they might reopen because they don't need to have the same amount of the cash for okay. people are using this. And, and really the have, that's not the best thing. It has yeah. six months of like after the mm -hmm. Because of data availability, since the, the payment method was implemented in 2020, yeah, we, we just have six months after the robbery so far. So like when we have more data, we include more data. So we had three, now we have six. I see, yeah, but, I see. but even, I mean, we, we, we might see permanent effects in the cash inventory, and that's fine because people, again, if the branch reopen, right? But people are not using cash before. So you don't need to have, but you don't need like a million dollars in cash or they don't need 500,000 dollars because people don't use it. Okay. People move it to a different. Yeah, it was asking for two reasons. First of all, um, the length, like the period of time, that the ATM is closed, being like there's some learning in, involved, right? In in adopting this yeah. since we're talking about technology That's adoption. Better, so so maybe it will be interesting to yeah. the variation. You're trying to do this okay. take to get this iterated. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. To see how the yeah. learning process, the learning the, curve, how the, uh, the learning dynamics. Yes, yes, that would be super interesting. The other yeah. that sounds there like like not that much of a concern, but it, it did cross uh, my mind. Uh, I don't know anything about risk management in ATMs, but if they are like, if they know that this is a place that has been uh, attacked in the past, and then the ATM has overall less cash because it's a riskier location, it does change the experience of going and not finding cash and so on. But this is more of a wild guess that I don't know uh, if they if there's if the experience changes because this. Is our risky location? Yeah, so we had we had a similar comment more on, on the fear to go to a bank branch, and our results are like we we exploit the results that, that are heterogeneous, like for locations that have more or less branch, 
And we do see that locations in which you have other like uh, alternatives to, to withdraw cash, the effects are much smaller. So if this would be the case for fear, which can be also like not exactly what we are saying, we would see that if you have alternatives, it wouldn't change like the, the results. As we do see that they, 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 they have, if they have alternatives, the, the results on peaks adoptions are much smaller. Seems that people are still going to the bank branch. They're not going to the same bank branch as before. But, but yeah, I, I think we wouldn't address the, your question. But yeah, that's a good point. I have a question that is not about your paper. It's about the PICS system. Now, I understand that this is a, a system of electronic transfers from the account of the buyer to the account of the seller. Now, um, now, I mean, but these, 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 these sort of transfers go through the traditional banking system. So presumably, uh, at some point, the accounts of these uh, banks at the central bank have to reflect this sort of yeah. movement. Now, uh, so when, when uh, suppose that I'm the seller, I get this inflow. Can I use this balance uh, immediately or do I have to wait for some time? I mean, do I get some sort of intraday credit uh, somehow? So, 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 so in, in, a, in, a, in a way, this is uh, trusting that the uh, sort of payment will be final when it is settled, uh, maybe at the, at the end of the day or something. So, if everything is being received at the same time, if you don't, the transfer fee you're not going to see now. Same second. Behind of that, there is a, a warranty system set up by the central bank and also the, the, the large value uh, compensation system of the central bank. But, the, but in peaks, in peaks, it's instant, as they said. And behind of that, there is a warranties that the central bank settle banks and other operators in order to, to, to guarantee the, 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 the functioning of the system. Yeah, it's very could you, could you clarify the difference between the fintechs and the digital banks? So, uh, uh, digital banks, they provide price service. They don't have a true. They don't have branch, they are digital. In the payment institution, they are not just for payment service. Uh, they just perform transactions. So those fintechs, do they have access to the large value payment? I mean, do they have accounts with the central bank? Yes, yes, they have. So it's like a bank, but just providing uh, payment service. Payment. No, no yeah, provide. It's a payment service provider. So they provide credit. No, no, they, but then we split them. If they the payment yeah. classification of payment institution, they, yeah. they, buy, they don't make deposits for them. Uh, the, the amount is sold to an account. They have an account for payment institution. It's not a deposit. They cannot use this for money. It's sold to a sign. Okay, so, so now that you know, they're not depositing. So uh, now Thank you. Just don't pay. And some of them are They have some. Yeah. And there are some that transition from payment. You usually don't manage. No, yeah. After a while, no, after a while, they become bank. They start as payment service providers, but then after four years. Do you, do you have? Do you have information on, on characteristics of the, of the users, for example, the age, the income? Because you could have a heterogeneous yeah, effect. We do, we do, but the data is so big that we aggregate it. But the way we found some resistance on age. Right? Some found that younger people adopt more. Yeah. It's this yeah. divide. Yeah. Uh, but we document this digital divide. So, uh, peaks, you know, we need younger people. That's why we actually say that. Okay, so yeah, the importance of cash, 
few special for like old individuals. Yes, because maybe in some regions and some areas are more there's more older people, so the, the impact should be lower, for yeah. example. We did a age division, we found that it's mostly young, younger adults. <clears throat> Sense, but so yeah. if there are no further questions. Uh, thank you, Sandra, and thank you, Bernardo, uh, for both presentations. And we go to a coffee break. Yes, I, I will propose to take a group picture before the coffee break. So I ask you to join here, and someone will take the, the picture of us. Thank you very much.
Rafael Repullo is going to present his work about interest rate, market power, and financial stability. But before, let me present him properly. Uh, Rafael is professor of economics and director of the Center for Monetary and Financial Studies, ENFI. Uh, he holds a PhD in economics from the London School of Economics and has worked in the Department of Economics there and also in the research department of the Bank of, of Spain. He's fellow of the Econometric Society and of the European Economic Association, research fellow of the Center for Economic Policy Research and member of the European Academy. He has also been president of the Spanish Economic Association, executive vice president of the Econometric Society, member of the executive committee of the European Economic Association, chair of the Scientific Council of the Toulouse School of Economics and co-editor of the International Journal of Central Banking. And in 2010, he received the Ray Jaime One Prize in Economics. So now we can start with the session after this presentation. <laughs> Many thanks, Victoria. I'm, I'm I'm really happy to be here. I think that being a member of the scientific committee of this conference from I guess the beginning is being it's been a pleasure really because uh, because it's uh, it's an opportunity to look at interesting papers to contribute to something that I think is very valuable and uh, and I think that uh, the main artist of this show is Jorge sitting here, which deserves basically almost all the credit. And the fact that we are all here, I think, is, is really a tribute to his, uh, his, his uh, dedication, his uh, ability of persuasion, and his uh, really uh, amazing personality. So Jorge, thank you very much. Okay, so this is uh, a joint work with uh, David Martinez Miera, who is at uh, Carlos III University in, in Madrid. And uh, this is about uh, the way in which interest rates uh, affect financial stability. So in the paper, we focus on risk taking by uh, banks, financial intermediaries, using a simple theoretical model, which is based in a, on, on a paper that we published uh, a few years ago uh, in Econometrica. Now, in a competitive setting like the one that we consider in search for yield, where banks were perfect competitors, the conventional prediction uh, obtains, i.e. this is the so-called risk-taking channel of monetary policy. Lower safe rates lead to higher risk-taking by banks. Now, the question that we address in this paper is what happens when we introduce market power, when banks uh, are not uh, price takers, but have the ability to earn some rents in their lending uh, operations. Now, uh, we can uh, ask the question, why do safe rates affect banks' risk taking? Well, safe rates affect banks' funding costs. Uh, they have an impact, of course, then on loan rates and intermediation margins. And uh, in a context in which there are frictions uh, uh, associated with uh, monetary incentives, then uh, these are, as I will show, linked to intermediation margins. So, and then they have an impact on the loan's probability of default. Now, competition is relevant because it affects the pass through from funding costs to loan rates and therefore affects the margins and the monetary incentives of the banks. Now, uh, when I refer to interest rates, uh, I am not going to be sort of uh, pointing out to what drives these changes in save rates. It may be real factors like the uh, traditional savings flood. It may be monetary policy. What uh, the paper does is to analyze the effects of uh, exogenous changes in real save rates. That's the the, uh, the name of the of the game. Now, just a brief uh, uh, overview of the model setup. The banks are going to be raising funds from uninsured risk-neutral investors. Uh, there is a section of the paper that looks at deposit insurance, but uh, this is, comes at the very end. Investors are going to require a given return R0, which is the save rate. This is what is going to be moving up and down. And uh, to model the market power, uh, we assume that banks compete a la Cournot in a low market. And uh, this uh, competition is measured by the number of banks. So when n equals one, we have monopoly. When n is large, we have something that approaches perfect competition. And uh, as I will see at some point, we examine the possibility of facing competition by uh, bond finance, direct market finance. Uh, banks are going to be monitoring borrowers, and this is the source of the moral hazard problem. Uh, monitoring reduces the probability of default of the loans, uh, uh, but uh, it is costly and it is unobserved by investors. So there is a moral hazard problem, which is at the core of the 
Now, the main result of the paper is that lower save rates lead to high risk taking in competitive environments. So this is the conventional prediction when high end, but lower risk taking in monopolistic environments with the low end. So, uh, so, so the idea, uh, the, the main result of this paper is that the risk taking channel of monetary policy reverses sign when banks have significant market power. So let me just give you a picture that uh, I will be showing later on. On the horizontal axis, you have the save rate. On the vertical axis, the probability of default of bank loans and the different uh, lines here represent different number of banks. The dark blue is N equals one, the monopoly. The uh, red uh, at the top is the N equals 10, which is something which is very close to uh, the competitive uh, outcome. Notice that you have a positive slope in monopolistic environments uh, for N equals one and two. And then you have this negative slope in competitive environments. So that's the conventional prediction. So, so somehow this is basically the main message of the paper. Of course, the paper also uh, has this, this result that uh, as you increase the number of banks and you the system become more competitive, margins uh, go down, and therefore you are going to have higher probabilities of default. So from that, this kind of perspective, uh, market power is, is good because it sort of uh, ameliorates the risk-taking incentives of the banks. Now, before I go into the model, let me just provide you some suggestive evidence. Uh, and what I want to compute is the sensitivity of loan rates and intermediation margins to changes in the federal funds rate for this and these aisles of banks' market power. So, the, so this is basically following the Drexler, Sabon, and Schnabel QJE paper. So we divide banks into 10 bins from the lowest to the highest per final index. So uh, the lowest is going to be the closest to competition. The highest is going to be the closest to monopoly. And estimate with quarterly data for banks in each bin I uh, from I equals one to I equals 10, this equation where the uh, parameter of interest is this beta. I mean, the sensitivity of either loan rates or intermediation margins to the changes in the federal funds rate. And the alpha B is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an individual bank uh, intercept. Now, uh, the data is the, the same one used by uh, Drexler et al. Uh, data on loan rates and intermediation margin comes from the call report for this sample period. The data on banks' market power is the FDIC data on county level deposits at bank branches. Uh, we, I mean, we compute the county level HHI for each year. Then uh, we use the weighted average for the county HHI for each banks using deposits uh, of each bank as, as weights. And then we compute a simple average for each bank in all years of the sample to say the, the, the measure of market power. Okay, so this is the first result. The sensitivity of loan rates to the federal fund rate. This is the beta that uh, for different desires. And notice that here you have a downward sloping uh, line. So for high market power, which is this uh, H uh, equals uh, 10, you have lower sensitivity of loan rates to the uh, federal funds rate. More interestingly is the what happens with uh, margins. Uh, notice that uh, for high market power, you have a negative sensitivity in the sense that margins go down when the federal funds rates goes up, right? So, so high interest rates decrease margins and therefore lead to lower monitoring, higher risk taking. That's, that's basically something that is uh, consistent with the kind of uh, uh, results that we're going to have in our uh, theoretical analysis. So, um, so summing up higher Fed funds rates implies higher loan rates and lower sensitivity for high market power and they have uh, higher margins for banks in competitive environments with the uh, desire at close to one and lower margins for banks in monopolistic environments. So uh, uh, since risk taking is driven by this intermediation margin in the context of our model, evidence is consistent with our key results. So anyway, so let me just uh, briefly the literature. There's a large literature on the risk taking channel of monetary policy. I have uh, singled out uh, the paper by my friends uh, Jimenez et al. Uh, with, uh, Bank of Spain data. There is an even larger literature on bank competition and risk taking, and perhaps the Hellman 
Murdoch and Stiglitz paper in the AR is one of the uh, main uh, uh, papers in this area. Not so many papers on the intersection of the two and the De La Ricci 11 and markets in the uh, Journal of Economic Theory is, is one of them. And of course, the main reference in terms of the uh, basic models uh, is the paper that I published with a bit uh, a few years ago. Okay, so what am I going to do today? Uh, well, uh, I will start with a simple uh, Kurnow model of bank competition and restaking. Then I will introduce uh, a competitive bond market, which limits uh, banks market power mm -hmm. then uh, i will do this is the part the new part of the paper uh, i will introduce uh, a dynamic model uh, of with uh, bank leverage uh, with endogenous bank leverage and uh, to show that the results are robust to uh, introducing uh, bank capital and bank leverage and uh, dynamic uh, considerations in terms of uh, endogenous charter values and finally and i don't think i would have uh, time for covering three extensions that I think are interesting in themselves. One is uh, what happens if banks are heterogeneous in their monitoring costs. So you have low monitoring costs and high monitoring costs. The banks with low monitoring costs are going to have higher uh, market share. And the question is how changes in the safe rate are going to affect uh, these two banks when they are competing a la Curno in the same market. So there is uh, some 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 interesting effect that happens in this uh, in this uh, situation some composition effect because the proportion of the market that is going to be covered by these different types of banks is going to be changed then we have a section on insured deposits uh, which actually makes life much easier because you don't have to endogenize uh, the, uh, the deposit rate is, is going to be equal to the safe interest rate. And, and finally, uh, the basic model is a model in which banks uh, are able to fund themselves at the safe rate. What if uh, there is also an hour supplying, uh, hour, hour sloping supply of deposits and the uh, deposit rates are endogenous? Uh, no zero lower bound, by the way, here. Right. And finally, I just will conclude. So, starting with the uh, model setup, uh, this is a static model today. There are three types of risk neutral agents. There are the entrepreneurs that have projects that require bank finance, banks that have to raise funds from these uh, uninsured investors, and they require these investors require an expected return R0, which is the safe interest rate. Now, the entrepreneurs uh, are characterized by this uh, production technology. Uh, you invest a unit at t equals zero, you get a return, which is stochastic, can be either success or failure. Success yields capital R with probability one minus P plus M. Failure is the complementary probability. I'm assuming for simplicity that it yields zero. And so P is the probability of failure without monitoring when M is equal to zero. And M is a number between zero and P is the monitoring intensity of the lending bank. So that's when you the bank monitors, then this is going to uh, make the uh, uh, probability of failure lower. Now, monitoring reduces the probability of failure, but uh, of course uh, is going to have a cost uh, and it's not going to be observed by the investors that are funding the bank. Now, there are three assumptions that uh, we make uh, to uh, uh, go uh, ahead. First of all, uh, I'm going to increase, uh, I, I, we assume that the uh, returns to the uh, the success return of uh, of the these investments is decreasing in the uh, overall level of aggregate investment. So, in, I mean, you, we can, you can rationalize that in terms of some sort of demand for the output produced by these entrepreneurs. And the higher the output, uh, uh, the lower is going to be the price at which these products are sold. And this is basically the uh, payoff of the entrepreneurs and uh, for simplicity and to be able to uh, compute the uh, Cournot equilibrium uh, in the simplest possible terms, uh, uh, we assume that this relationship is linear. Now, the second assumption uh, is that uh, we are going to have a single aggregate risk factor. So defaults uh, are driven by uh, basically the fact that this uh, risk factor, uh, which you could think of a uniform distribution between uh, zero and one, um, is going to uh, generate perfectly correlated project returns. So there is no idiosyncratic risk here if uh, uh, for any given M. So when P minus M is equal to a certain value, then all the projects fail at the same time or succeed at the same time. This is something that can be relaxed, but of course, uh, uh, in this simple manner, the probability of default of an individual loan is the probability of failure of a bank because all the portfolio is going to fail. 
And finally, uh, there is the important assumption of free entry of entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurs are going to get this R of L, this is the success return, and the interest rate uh, is, um, I say with a slight abuse of notation, just equal to R. So, so they are going to enter the market uh, until the surplus that they get is zero. So, um, and of course, from, from this expression, you can see that the R of L is the inverse loan demand function. Given the amount of loans, then you can compute what's the interest rate that uh, is going to obtain in the market, which is this nice uh, linear expression here. Okay. So there's going to be N identical banks that compete a la Cournot. The strategic variable of bank J is it's lending LJ to the entrepreneurs, and the total amount of lending is just the sum of the LJs, uh, and this is what is going to determine the uh, interest rate that uh, the bank is going to be setting. Okay, the banks are going to be setting. Now, uh, on, the, on, the, on the side of the banks, uh, I'm going to assume initially that banks have no capital, so they are entirely funded with uninsured deposits, uh, and uh, in the uh, section three, we look at uh, uh, endogenous uh, leverage. Uh, the second assumption is that bank monitoring is costly. And uh, just to simplify everything, I, we assume that the cost of monitoring is just quadratic in the uh, monitoring effort. And finally, uh, this is uh, obviously uh, an important assumption. This is the informational friction. Bank monitoring is not contractible. So that generates a moral hazard problem between the banks and the investor. The investors are lending to the bank and putting their money in the bank, but they don't control what the bank is actually doing in terms of monitoring, and therefore in terms of the risk of uh, its portfolio. Okay, structure of the game, there are three stages. Stage one is the Kurno competition. Each bank is going to set the supply of loans, LJ. This is going to determine the total supply of loans and the loan rate. And uh, sec yeah, sure. Uh, you assume that the monitoring uh, directly impacts the probability of success, and so, so in particular, it benefits the, the entrepreneur. Uh, no, because because inter entrepreneurs get zero surplus. So. I, they always get zero surplus. Yes. Okay. And I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, this is something is the same in my earlier paper. I think that's something that should be uh, studied, and your student did it uh, 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 a few years ago, is to look at uh, the effect of, uh, of, of uh, the monitoring on the part of the bank and uh, effort on the part of the entrepreneurs and see what's the uh, net effect. But here we don't have any effort on the part of the entrepreneurs, the firms. And so therefore it's the only, that side, the only motor has problems on that side. She didn't publish that paper, did she? Beautiful paper. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, so now uh, second stage, Bank J offers uh, an interest rate, which I'm going to call BJ. This is the borrowing rate uh, to the investors in order to secure funding for the amount of loans uh, J, right? And uh, finally, uh, the bank is going to choose the monitoring intensity MJ. Okay, so that's the structure of the game. Now, of course, the game is all backwards, stages two and three first, and then stage one. Or um, notice that in stages two and three, there is no strategic interaction uh, among the banks because uh, it is the banks with the investors. Uh, therefore, there is, the, there is uh, at that point, I don't care about what the other banks do. And uh, it's the same problem for all banks uh, because they have uh, the same loan rate uh, determined in the first stage. So uh, what this means is that uh, I'm going to write uh, BJ as B of L and MJ as M of L, forgetting about the subscript uh, J, because all the banks are going to be doing the same thing. Okay, so how do we characterize the equilibrium of this model? Well, equilibrium is characterized by a bank's choice of monitoring given the borrowing rate. So in the right-hand side, you have with probability one minus P plus M, they get the difference between the loan rate and the borrowing rate, right? And then of course, you have to subtract the cost of monitoring, uh, and this is for each individual loan, right? So that's how the uh, monitoring intensity is determined. On the other hand, uh, you have to uh, make sure that the investors uh, are satisfied and that they get in expected terms, this is the probability that they will get this uh, B of L, which is a gross rate, and it has to be equal to the gross required return. Now, here you have a system of two equations with two unknowns. Uh, the solution is going to give the B of L and the M of L, and this is basically the proposition one in the paper. 
Now, um, it's interesting to look at the problem that the banks are solving. I mean, I, I've really written like this. If you look at the first sort of condition to that problem, you differentiate with respect to M, then you just get the intermediation margin, right? And minus the marginal cost of monitoring. With a quadratic equation, this is going to be linear. So what you have here is that the monitoring intensity is basically proportional to the margin, right? So that's the connection between why uh, market power matters because that determines margins and that determines the monitoring uh, and therefore the probability of defaults of the loan. Now, uh, to go to stage one, uh, then uh, it's, easy to, it's, it's convenient to write profits per unit of loans. Uh, this is just substituting the uh, values of M of L and B of L that result from solving the previous system of equations and asymmetric Cournot equilibrium is, is one in which uh, given the choices of the N minus one banks, uh, the choice of bank L, this is a profit per unit of loans times the amount of lending, is going to give you back the L star. So that's the uh, equilibrium condition and total lending is going to give you the L star, right? So the second result in this uh, paper is that a decrease in the save rate leads to an increase in total lending L star. Well, I mean, actually this looks pretty obvious, sort of lower interest rates and the funding lead to lower uh, Ls. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, if you look at the proof in the paper, it's pretty horrible. I don't know why, but... <laughs> I mean, it was sort of, it's, it's, it's sort of brute force. I mean, you just go through the, the, the algebra and then it is true. So lower rates are always expansionary on the credit side. Now, the, the third proposition is, is, is going to focus on, on two limit cases, what happens in the monopoly and what happens under perfect competition. And the monopoly, a decrease in the save rate is going to lead to an increase in monitoring M star and a decrease in the probability of loan default. Of course, uh, the two things are connected in one to one. And uh, under competition, when N is sufficiently large, actually it doesn't have to go to plus infinity. It, it, you, you, it stops before plus infinity. A decrease in the save rate leads to a decrease in monitoring and an increase in the probability of, of loan default. So this is basically the, 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 the picture that I produced uh, at the very beginning. You have this positive slope in monopolistic environments. Uh, you have a negative slope in competitive environments. And then the question is what happens in the middle? What happens in the middle is you can see that well, I mean, things uh, start becoming flatter, and then at the, at some point they reverse the sign, and then you get the negative slope that corresponds to the competitive uh, environments. Okay. So the intuition for this result is, is basically related to the literature of the past through in Cournot oligopoly. With competition, lower costs have little impact on, on margins uh, because basically the, the, the interest rate is going to be close to the to the uh, to the to the funding rate. So uh, margins uh, and monitoring go down in, in, in the case of, of this model. So you're going to have riskier banks. With monopoly, lower costs have a larger impact on, on margins. Uh, as long rates do not react uh, much to the changes in the save rate. And so uh, in this case of this uh, model, margins and monitoring go up, and so you have safer banks. So that's the, it's, it's important, it's important. So I don't know, I mean, uh, what, uh, as you know, the IO people would probably point out that, uh, well, if you don't have the right concavity, then things may go wrong. And uh, and so, I don't know. Uh, I think that uh, this is something that uh, perhaps we should explore more in detail. Yeah, but, uh, okay. So let me, I mean, summing up, uh, yeah. You. Uh, like more hazard problems on the part of the borrower. Like I know that you're not, you know, like, but but when interest rates are high, they have like less skin in the game, so effort provision. So that that's that's why it's a bit super. So usually, our intuitions that I have very high interest rates, you have to monitor more because the more hazard problem is more severe. Yeah, like constant and something like that, and then the they have less skin in the game. So when interest rates are very low, they have maybe more skin in the more skin in the game, and then they have to monitor less. So that's Starting to compare the results of the like standard home structure. Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 the classical paper in this area is what uh, Boyd and De Nicolo had in the, I think it was 2005 JF paper, and 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 they they put the moral hazard on the borrower side, and and then of course uh, you have very different results, and so so here we are putting the moral hazard on the on the bank side. 
And uh, well, I mean, okay, I mean, you can argue. I, I mean, I, I think that uh, what uh, would be uh, sort of uh, interesting and, and, and useful is to consider a model that contemplates both sides. I mean, this is one of the students of uh, John Charles at uh, Toulouse did something like that. And uh, I think that, uh, I mean, problem is, is that it tends to get ambiguous results because it depends on which of the two uh, sort of uh, moral hazard problems is, is, is more severe, right? But uh, so uh, I think if I remember correctly, uh, what was the, the result there? Okay, so so let me now uh, sort of uh, move on to uh, the model with the uh, competitive uh, bond market, which uh, produces uh, something uh, perhaps not too surprising now. So the, the basic model uh, is one in which uh, banks are funded by investors and, in, and the banks in turn uh, fund entrepreneurs. Now, what happens if uh, investors can directly fund entrepreneurs? Okay, so what's different about direct market finance? Uh, well, uh, that uh, um, market, uh, um, we're assuming that direct market finance entails no monitoring in the sense that, uh, well, I mean, these are supposed to be dispersed bondholders that don't have the incentives to uh, actually do what uh, banks do, which is presumably sort of uh, be careful at the screening and monitoring of uh, project. So if there is no monitoring, then uh, the participation constraint is just uh, our aim is the uh, uh, return, uh, the, the, the interest rate uh, charged by market lenders, no aim. So therefore the participation constraint is that in expected terms, they should get R0. So you can solve up for the RM from here. And uh, so that's going to be an upper bound on the rate that banks can charge because uh, if, if banks can try to charge a higher interest rate, then these, uh, these, these borrowers will go somewhere else, uh, even if they don't get uh, the, that is important that they don't get the benefits of monitoring because otherwise this would be different. Now, uh, when will the bound be binding? Well, I mean, this is a representation of the, connection between the safe interest rate and the loan rate in the model without the bond market. So notice that higher interest rates translate into higher uh, loan rates. But notice that the, the black, the sort of the blue line is the monopoly case. Notice that the slope is, is lower in the case of monopoly. And of course, monopoly charges higher rates. So the blue line is above all the other lines here. Now, if we introduce here, the upper bound uh, that uh, the, this, this sort of credible threat of going to the uh, market lenders, then what happens is that there are all these lines here that are no longer feasible. So because, I mean, basically they are cut off. Uh, the, the banks, if they want to get some business, they have to be competitive relative to the bond market. And therefore, you, all, you only have that. In terms of the, 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 when, when, when the bond is binding, uh, the bank will choose LM such that this is what uh, obtains the uh, market interest rate. And the equilibrium is characterized by something which is more simple because the RM is now given uh, by this, uh, uh, by this uh, constraint. And well, anyway, so what you can do is, is uh, this is the bank's first order condition. This is the intermediation margin. That's the marginal cost of monitoring. The, you substitute into this expression the, the RM and the B uh, from the participation constraint, then what you get is an expression that equilibrium monitoring is going to be uh, something like this. Notice that this is increasing in the safe rate. So, so what happens here, just to put a picture, is that uh, what, instead of having the sort of downward sloping lines for high market power, then we have a U-shaped relationship because at some point, the competition from the bond market is going to be binding and therefore the banks are no longer able to charge higher loan rates because of that. So anyway, I will say something about this uh, in terms of uh, testable predictions. Uh, when you have a U, it's, it's sort of nice to have a quadratic term in the regression. Okay, so... Um, so let me uh, move to the uh, dynamic uh, model with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with bank leverage. Now, um, the question that uh, um, we wanted to address here is what happens when banks can adjust the leverage? Uh, in particular, what happens when banks can uh, sort of, uh, uh, when, when the bank shareholders can contribute inside equity, I mean, uh, uh, equity that is provided by those taking the monitoring decisions, right? Okay, so, um, and, 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 and so what uh, I want to, uh, at the same time, uh, just for sort of simplicity, 
is suppose that this inside equity capital is provided by long-lived agents that take the monitoring decisions. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm going to assume as it is standard in, in the literature that the shareholders discount rate is the safe interest rate plus some additional uh, excess cost of capital, which is positive, right? So that's the uh, same as in the uh, De La Riccia, Levin and Marcus paper. So now, instead of having three stages, we have four stages. Stage one is the same as before. Uh, each bank sets the supply of loans, LJ. Then in the second stage, each bank is going to choose its capital per unit of loans, call it KJ. Uh, and then uh, stages three and four are like we have before. The bank J offers an interest rate BJ to the outside investors, and the bank is going to be choosing the monetary intensity. Now, stage two is important because, of course, this KJ means that there is skin in the game. So from the perspective of the investors that are going to find the bank, the one minus K, uh, the bank is going to be making more effort, uh, monitoring effort, because it has uh, this uh, contributed this KJ. OK. So uh, what happens if uh, a bank fails in this setup? Well, if a bank fails, it's going to lose the charter value. A new bank is going to enter the market. And so the total number of banks is always N, just to uh, avoid uh, the, I mean, something which is actually uh, interesting. Uh, this is something that uh, some people have explored. The fact that, well, I mean, uh, if uh, as a result of uh, the failure of some competitors, your market power is increased, then perhaps you have an incentive to be more prudent because you know that there is a price to surviving, right? So nothing like this. I mean, here a bank fails, a new bank enters the market, so we can uh, sort of keep N as the, uh, uh, reference for the uh, extent of competition in the market. Okay. Now, there are two interesting limit cases. What happens when the excess cost of capital delta is equal to zero? Well, I mean, when the excess cost of capital is equal to zero, then uh, banks will be fully funded with equity capital. Why go to these outside investors that generate some moral hazard problem when I don't have, I mean, I have I'm a deep pocket investor. I can uh, so so basically all equity capital. The moral has a problem disappears, and in fact, what you can show here is the same results uh, as in the uh, benchmark model. Notice that in the benchmark model, uh, this is the safe rate. This is probability of default. Positive slow for n equals one and two here. Negative slow for the other class. So, so I mean, exactly the same as before. Now, what happens when the excess cost of capital is very large? Well, if, if the cost of capital is very large, then the banks will say, no, I mean, I'm not going to contribute any capital. The uh, K is equal to zero. The charter value is also equal to zero because charter values are the discounted flow of future dividends. The discount rate is plus infinity. Then, of course, uh, the future doesn't count. It's identical to the benchmark model. So, mm -hmm. so there is no change in that. So somehow in these two limit cases, we have uh, the same results that uh, we had in the, uh, in the basic static model. So the question is, uh, is uh, uh, the case where delta is strictly between zero and plus infinity uh, going to change the results? And well, I mean, this is uh, the, I mean, it's, it's a little bit complicated because you have to work through the equilibrium charter value. I mean, what you have here is the contribution of the shareholders at any date, right? Here is what happens tomorrow. Uh, this is the discount rate R0 plus delta. With this probability, they are going to get R minus 1 minus KJB. Remember that this is the only part that is uh, funded by the outside uh, investors. K is provided by the insiders. Then you have to subtract the cost of monitoring. And then this is the uh, amount of the charter value that you have. And this is multiplied by LJ. And I think that there is a typo here. So let me not. Uh, and of course, uh, you want to solve the Wellman equation, so the future uh, thing is exactly what uh, obtains from maxima. Why is no? This, uh, I just discovered that that's the mistake. It should be outside. Yes, sorry. Yeah, no. The V is is the continuation value. It doesn't depend on my current decision. Sorry. Uh, okay. Right, so so what happens in this case? Well, lower safe rates is going to lead to lower capital per unit of loans. This is what uh, we denote the leverage effect. Uh, and, and I mean, uh, one, one simple way to understand this is that remember that the delta, the spread is the same, right? So if, if, if I lower the R0, in relative terms, capital is going to be more expensive than, uh, than, than outside funding. So this is going to reduce uh, the K, right? 
So lower skin in the game, and therefore this is going to push for higher risk-taking incentives. Right? On the other hand, if you lower the safe rate, uh, this is going to lead to higher charter value for two reasons, because banks are going to be more profitable. Think of a monopoly with a lower cost of funding. And notice that, of course, the discount rate is going to be lower. So this, this sort of discounted sum of future profits is going to be bigger. So, And this is going to push uh, for a higher survival payoff uh, and lower risk taking incentives. So in fact, this is this the question is which effect dominates and uh, what we show in the papers that this depends on the number of banks. By the way, these are numerical results. These are not analytical results, okay? So that's, uh, okay, so this is what happens, yeah. No, N is the number of banks. It is, Oh, no, I, I, we don't allow free entry because the name of the game is to discuss competition. Uh, the Yeah. Okay. If the number of banks is an endogenous variable, they are going to enter uh, as long as the uh, V is, is, is positive, right? Because uh, this is the value of the charter, right? So, so this is the value of, uh, of course, the value of the charter is going to come down if more banks enter the market, right? But uh, yeah. But that's yeah we haven't we haven't <laughs> explored that uh, yeah that, that's uh, uh, yeah in a dynamic concept this is this is relevant uh, actually we did have a section in the in the or previous version of the paper with with endogenous entry it was uh, I mean the, the way to sort of uh, keep the results more or less unchanged is to assume that there is a cost of entry. Uh, uh, and, and that that uh, sort of uh, generates uh, a number of banks that is not going to drive the the, the the charter value to zero. Okay, so so this is the picture that obtains here uh, on the leverage effect. Notice that as, as the interest rate goes down, then the capital per unit of loans is also going to go down. So that means that there is less skin in the game, more incentives to uh, take on more risk by reducing your monitoring. On the other hand, what happens to charter value is the opposite. Notice that as the interest rate comes down, notice that charter values go up, especially when you have n equals one or two, right? So, so uh, and it's almost flat. It's not exactly flat for the n equals 10. So, so you have these two forces going in the opposite direction. Notice that uh, the leverage effect appears here even when you have n equals 10, right? So you would expect, uh, whereas the charter value is almost flat here. So you would expect that basically this is what happens with the, uh, with the PD, right? So uh, in this case, when you have a large number of banks, the, the leverage effect dominates. And what happens here is that you get the negative relationship between the probability of default and the uh, and the uh, uh, save rate. Whereas for uh, uh, mark high market power, n equals one and two, what happens is that the uh, charter value effect dominates and you have the... So bottom line is that the situation when you have endogenous leverage is very similar to what we had in the static model. So, so this idea that the um, risk-taking channel of reverse assign seems to be uh, the kind of uh, result that uh, one would expect, uh, at least for this type of uh, models. Now, how am I doing with the time, Victoria? Oh, okay, right. So, okay, good. So, um, I mean, let me uh, cover briefly the three extensions that uh, we have. The first one uh, is, I mean, and I'm going to discuss the extensions uh, back in the static uh, benchmark model with no inside equity and no charter values. Now, the first extension is uh, what happens if you have uh, large and small banks, uh, i.e., low monitoring costs and high monitoring cost banks. Uh, the second extension is what if uh, deposits are insured? The third one is what if we also have competition uh, for deposits? Now, um, the heterogeneous monitoring costs, I only have one slide. Uh, suppose that you have these two types of banks, high and low uh, monitoring cost banks. And well, the main results are uh, as follows. The effects of an increase in the save rates is that low cost banks uh, are going to be safer, right? I mean, okay, this is this is an increase. It's not a reduction. It's the interest rate goes up. Um, uh, low cost banks are going to be safer. Why is that? Well, because the increase in the save rate is going to push out 
a little bit the, 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 the high cost bank because they cannot afford basically operating. Uh, and that's why they are going to be risky. I mean, somehow the, the, the higher interest rate environment is going to be beneficial to the low, especially beneficial to the low cost banks, which are, which, which are going to be able to increase their market share and increase their margins. And therefore that's why they are safer. The high cost banks are going to be riskier because they, uh, they are getting their margins squeezed. Uh, the market share of the low cost bank increases. And interestingly, the average probability of default in the system goes down. I mean, average means that the proportion of uh, uh, lending by the high cost and the proportion multiplied by the PD of the high, and similarly, the proportion it goes down. So, so the results are closer to the model with low market powers, with a downward sloping decrease. And that's because of this composition effect that, uh, uh, that um, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, uh, actually, it is. Uh, I mean, this is a result when both uh, types of banks are alive. Uh, I mean, if, if when when the what you're saying is what happens if the gap in the marginal cost goes to zero, then then obviously there is no discontinuity. You go back to the uh, to the previous results. Depends on N, yes. Oh, yes, it depends on N. Actually, in, in this setting, you have uh, uh, NH banks with high monitoring costs and uh, L banks with uh, low monitoring costs, and the sum of NH and NL is equal to N. Right. So, so, I mean, you have a, a, a proportion of the banks with high monitoring costs, a proportion of the banks with low monitoring costs. And then uh, the, 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 the differential effect that uh, happens here compared to the original model is in the fact that there is this redistribution of lending across the two types of banks when interest rates uh, uh, change. And of course, this is going to depend on the number of low cost banks, the number of high cost banks, and and but but there is no discontinuity. So if you, if you take the limit, uh, the the okay, maybe yes, it it it, it depends on it depends on n and uh, okay. Let, let, let me let me try to show you the pictures that uh, we have. I mean, okay. Here, what we try to focus uh, in this section is in this composition effect for a given n, right? So, so we don't uh, the 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 changes in n are now more complicated because you just have two n's. The the n, n. Okay. insure deposits. Well, this is easier. Uh, uh, maybe I should have started with that. If uh, if deposits are insured, the banks are going to be funded at the same rate. So the borrowing rate is just going to be the R zero. The model is simpler. And the main result is that uh, increasing the save rate always lead to lower margins. Uh, so they therefore increase uh, the probability of default and uh, therefore the results uh, are going to be similar to the model with high market power, right? So that's, uh, I mean, and, and in a way, uh, it, it, I mean, the, the, the banks have an incentive to monitor in order to reduce the cost of external borrowing because the borrowers anticipate that you're going to be doing higher monitoring. If the cost of your borrowing doesn't depend on your monitoring because it's just the uh, safe interest rate, then there is less of an incentive to, uh, to monitor because it's not going to be rewarded. And therefore, in the end, you're going to have uh, uh, these uh, increases in the probability of uh, default. Finally, endogenous deposit rates. Well, I mean, I guess that there is some interest in the uh, construction of this uh, inverse uh, linear supply function of deposits. Uh, and then uh, one uh, sort of uh, feature of these type of, uh, of, 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 of models of uh, uh, competition, imperfect competition, is that uh, you have to introduce a balance sheet constraint. Otherwise, uh, you're you are in trouble. And that's the reason why Kurno models are 
easier and probably uh, better than uh, Bertrand models because uh, in a Cournot model you can you choose the L and the D and therefore you satisfy the uh, the balance sheet constraint in in Bertrand type of models then your L and your D depends on the rates set by the other banks so you may have a gap uh, that so you have to explain how this is filled okay. So uh, results are very similar to those of the original model uh, because you, on top of the margin that you get on the lending, you have the margin that you earn on deposit taking. And of course that depends on the number of banks. So this uh, basically uh, delivers the same type of uh, results that we have. Okay, so let me conclude uh, with a brief summary of uh, the paper and then some testable implications. Now, uh, what this paper tries to argue is that uh, market structure, in particular uh, competition among banks, shapes the effect of safe rates on financial stability. With high competition, you have lower rates uh, uh, implying riskier banks. With low competition, lower rates imply uh, safer banks. Now, the results are obviously consistent with the charter value hypothesis that competition always increases uh, banks' uh, risk taking because it reduces the incentive to uh, monitor. Now, one, uh, there, there is this view that, uh, uh, which is coming from the uh, risk taking channel, that uh, I mean, if, if, if you want to have higher credit, uh, you, you, you have to uh, be uh, willing to take on uh, more risk in the financial system. Well, I mean, if, if banks have uh, a lot of market power, then you can expand uh, the credit supply without threatening because the banks are going to be more prudent in their lending policies. So, so in that sense, there wouldn't be a trade-off between uh, credit uh, provision and, and financial stability. But of course, uh, this is at the cost of uh, banks having significant market power, and that has a, a distortion in terms of uh, welfare that uh, we don't discuss here, but of course uh, is, 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 is there, right? Now, one, one, one thing that uh, you should, uh, I mean, uh, following the uh, global financial crisis, uh, there was, uh, um, a, 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 a significant increase in consolidation among banks, so, so the, 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 the market power increased. So, so in, in, in on the way sort of uh, to normalization of interest rates, now we are in the upper sloping part of this uh, line, assuming that you have sufficient market power. So that means that higher interest rates are going to translate into higher risk taking. So it's not, uh, it's, it sort of goes in reverse, assuming that you have uh, enough uh, market power in order to be in the our sloping part of the relationship. Okay, now uh, let me just uh, go through some testable implications. Uh, I guess that many of the people here are empirically oriented, so let me just say what uh, one could do uh, with this model. Now, uh, the, the main testable implication is that uh, the relationship between interest rates and risk taking, uh, this of course this would be a, a, an equation to be estimated with individual bank data, and risk could be measured with uh, non-performing loans uh, ratio, something of that sort. Now notice that the, the beta one is negative. So higher market power reduces risk taking, right? That's, that's the simple part, right? Now, the, the, the interest rate here has, I mean, suppose that the Herfindal is equal to zero. That would be the perfect competition here. Then you would have a negative relationship between risk taking and interest rates. That's the uh, standard uh, risk taking channel. Now, of course, uh, if the Herfindal moves away from zero and goes towards uh, higher values, then uh, here you are going to have the opposite effect. You are going to have something that at some point, uh, may actually reverse the negative sign. So, so you can have the derivative with respect to R0 is going to be beta 0 plus beta 2 times the Herfindal. If the Herfindal is sufficiently high, then of course you are going to have the positive relationship that uh, I was uh, putting in this uh, picture. Now, um, there are other testable implications, just mentioned two. Uh, Nonlinear effects of direct market finance this is the U shaped relationship. Now, one way to capture well, here again, the Herfin that has a negative sign. To capture the U shaped relationship, one can do this kind of thing. So, so with uh, this would capture the downward sloping part of the U curve. Uh, remember that you have risk on the uh, and this would capture the uh, upper sloping uh, part of the relationship. And of course, that only happens for high values of the Herfindal, because for low values of the Herfindal, then you're going to get the negative sign. I mean, if, if the HHI is equal to zero, 
then you just have the negative relationship that obtains under perfect competition. The, the threat of competition by the bond market is irrelevant. So that, that would be a, a way of, of sort of uh, trying to test uh, the implications of this model when you have uh, uh, competition by uh, direct markets finance. Now, finally, uh, proportion D of insured deposits. Now, uh, I didn't uh, sort of state the result. I just uh, said that uh, the model becomes similar to the model with high market power. And therefore, with high market power, then you have a positive relationship between R0 and restaking. So that's uh, the, uh, which may actually reverse that uh, negative number. So anyway, so these are three uh, sort of uh, ways of uh, looking at uh, what the model implies. I have no idea whether it's something that uh, has been done, although I think that uh, um, uh, Stephen Ongina mentioned that he could do this over the weekend. <laughs> He's got the data, so anyway, so I, I'm not aware that he's done it. So anyway, so that's uh, uh, basically the end of my uh, talk, except for the fact that, uh, well, being here uh, in Uruguay uh, on Friday, so, uh, I mean, everybody was very sad, and, uh, well, I mean, so let me say that. Uh, so sorry about the World Cup. Uh, what can we do? I mean, this is... Uh, it, was, it wasn't the team's fault. It was something happening with uh, the... Uh, yeah, right. So anyway, so that's uh, uh, right. So let me stop here. I guess that uh, I don't know if, how much time we have. Yes, we leave the floor open for questions. I don't know. Well, let, let me leave the sad thing here. <laughs> Celia? No? Uh, Joshua? Um, do you think it would work? I mean, what, what would happen if instead of monitoring, the bank was screening? Uh, oh, dear. Yes. Um, Okay, yes, I mean, uh, screening is a lot more complicated. Why? Because uh, when banks screen uh, a pool of borrowers, what happens is that the action of screening by a bank affects the, their, the, the rest of the pool, right? And therefore, uh, you have a, a sort of a complicated interaction. I think that... Uh, no, but you could assume that uh, they are not allowed to apply again if they are rejected once. Yes, you cannot apply again. No. Yes, I, 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 there was um, um, there, there was a, I mean, you, you can do a, a quick and dirty uh, uh, approach to that, which uh, um, I've noticed that uh, there's a paper by uh, Elhanan Heldman uh, in a completely different context in which firms screen workers and 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 but that uh, increases the productivity of the workers that are selected but without having any impact on that so if if you were to take that view then um then um uh, then there wouldn't be any i mean basically it's a matter of terminology it would be exactly the same kind of uh, results but i mean uh, I am a bit reluctant uh, because I think that the uh, essence of screening is that you have a pool of potential borrowers that you, you select them and then uh, with different characteristics. And, and then the fact that uh, banks are screening uh, makes a difference and uh, you, you have a, a sort of a strategic interaction uh, among the banks. I think that uh, this, this guy, uh, Thorsten Broker, in this uh, old econometrica paper, did something like this, and you had mixed strategies and all, all, all kinds of complications. So, so I, I... If I may, uh, um, I seem to remember that you have another paper with David on the non-banks. If you have uh, non-banks that do not monitor, which seems to be the, the trend now with uh, artificial intelligence yeah. and big data, and you don't need to monitor, you just... Uh, so what would happen in this case if you had uh, uh, competition with non-monitoring? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I mean, go, going through the other paper, uh, I think is is something that may take. But but notice that uh, the the competition with non-banks is is in a way already here. I mean, when I when I do this uh, market finance, then uh, essentially what happens is that uh, you you have. Uh, uh, the possibility, I mean, it's sort of some sort of limit pricing, right? So, so somehow, uh, and then what you get is is a sort of, uh, I guess, that uh, uh, interesting uh, 
relationship that uh, you you get a U uh, shape relationship, which I think is. Uh, Hi, uh, I was wondering a little bit about your definition of financial stability. If I understood correctly, it is the probability of default. Huh. But in my mind, uh, if, for instance, uh, one there's just one bank and it fails, that that's less financial stability than if you have 10 banks and just one fails. So I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, I mean, there are, there are two sort of uh, ways to sort of make the model uh, more realistic. Uh, one would be to uh, assume that, uh, I mean, that um, uh, borrowers, uh, I mean, that uh, loan defaults are not perfectly correlated. So there is some kind of uh, um, a sort of uh, a stochastic uh, sort of uh, differences uh, uh, in, in, in the failure rate. It's not just P minus M, it's P minus M plus some, some sort of uh, error. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and uh, that, uh, the, the second thing would be to uh, assume that somehow banks uh, are uh, sort of uh, affected by different uh, uh, systematic risk factors. So they are not subject to the same risk factor. And therefore, you can have some banks failing, some banks not failing. And uh, um, OK, uh, the um, uh, I mean, I mean, having worked with the uh, Vasicek model for, I mean, the, the kind of foundation for the Basel II, Basel III capital requirements, I mean, the natural thing for me would be to think of, of this sort of framework in which there are systematic and idiosyncratic uh, risk factors affecting uh, firm defaults. And then, of course, if you want to have the kind of effect to have some sort of imperfectly correlated systematic shocks across banks, right? So that, uh, um, is it doable? I think in the context of the simplest model with uh, with numerical results, I think yes. Uh, and uh, uh, that that would open a, a, in the dynamic context an interesting uh, feature that uh, I mean um, uh, you, you you have uh, if, if, if the number of banks if, if banks don't fail at the same time and the number of banks is is endogenous in the sense that it depends on the past history I mean, maybe a probability that a new bank enters the market after a while then you you have this sort of uh, what uh, Enrico Perotti has called the last bank standing effect that uh, the fact that uh, uh, surviving uh, uh, means uh, monopoly rents, and therefore that brings incentives for prudent behavior. So, I mean, I think that these these kind of things uh, can can be done. I think it, maybe we should do them at some point. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the very interesting presentation. Um, my my first question is related to the previous one. Uh, so, in your model, equity serves only. Uh, as a device to to influence the uh, incentives for monitoring, but not as a loss buffer, and uh, of course not, uh, not as a loss buffer. So equity is not a loss buffer in your model, right? Because uh, you kind of assume that in the bad state there's a zero payoff, right? So so I would be really curious to to understand uh, uh, which results are robust if equity also serves a role as a loss buffer. Um, Okay, well, this is a, a really interesting uh, suggestion, and uh, I, 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 a few years ago, uh, um, uh, I, I, I supervised a master thesis uh, at Semfi uh, of someone who actually is, is sorry, I mean, Madeleine Castell, she's a student of Vico Vanasco, she's working at the European Central Bank now, and 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 the point of the master thesis was to try to separate the incentive effect from the buffer effect and see uh, which of, uh, I mean, to compare them somehow, uh, uh, because typically the regulation only cares about the buffer effect, uh, not the incentive effect. And I think it would be nice to have some sort of framework. It, it wasn't very successful, but uh, I think that uh, this is the kind of project that uh, at some point deserves the uh, participation of the supervisor uh, to to make it happen, and, and so it didn't happen. But uh, but I think that yeah, I mean I, I completely agree with you. I think that uh, in a context like uh, I mean, if we were to introduce this sort of uh, 
in perfect default correlation, then of course capital would serve as a buffer, and and then you would have uh, a number of uh, of uh, sort of uh, additional uh, sort of uh, connections. And uh, so anyway, so I haven't done it yet. The, the uh, second question is uh, uh, related to uh, real versus nominal. So in your model, everything is real, but. Uh, I'm I'm uh, wondering uh, uh, whether you you stepping back from the model whether you think that actually uh, also nominal rates have an, have have implications. So, so so there's this older literature that that suggests that uh, uh, high inflation is not good for financial stability. Uh, I have a little bit difficulties conceptually to 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 wrap my head around it, but but I'm wondering what you think about that. Well, I mean, let, let, I mean, last uh, Thursday I was at a conference at the Bank of Spain, in which uh, um, um, uh, Paul Antras from uh, Harvard was uh, presenting something about globalization, and 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 uh, he he was asked something about uh, the effect of uh, deglobalization on inflation, monetary policy, and his answer was that he's uh, he's a trade uh, economist that. Uh, only has worked on relative prices, not uh, absolute prices. And, uh, and I guess that I could answer the same manner. I think that, uh, I, mean, I mean, of course, uh, central banks uh, care about inflation and, and these sort of, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, questions uh, really have uh, implications. I mean, uh, the, the, the extent of uh, 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 the effect of competition uh, on financial stability when you look at uh, uh, changes in nominal rates as opposed to real rates, uh, then is something that, uh, 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 I mean, they care very much about, And but I don't think I have much to say. I mean, the problem with nominal, uh, uh, I mean, Jan Charles, you, you, you probably have some, uh, is that, Somehow you have to introduce some nominal frictions of some sort, and uh, uh, the way in which uh, macroeconomists typically introduce nominal frictions is uh, perhaps uh, less satisfactory than what the literature really takes for granted. I mean, everybody is used to calvo pricing and this sort of thing, but maybe I mean this is not particularly. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's I guess a, a quick and dirty way of of sort of uh, building nominal frictions, but I'm I'm not sure that uh, uh, this is uh, that this is capturing the reality of uh, the way in which uh, uh, nominal frictions and nominal uh, interest rates and, uh, affect prices. So I, I just have no idea, but uh, this is much further away from my uh, sort of current line of research. I think that's uh, that's a tall order. Just a comment on the question of auction. So I'm not going to ask us anything. But from a, a very experienced inflation country, uh, uh, I, I would say that inflation has short term and, and long term effect on, on financial stability. In the short term, banks benefit from, from, from inflation. So there's there's actually a positive effect on, on, on the balance sheet of the banks. And that's the evidence for, for Uruguay and several other countries. In the long run, in the long run, uh, persistent inflation, high inflation, uh, erodes the role of uh, the currency that uh, reduces the size of domestic uh, currency markets, and that, that has two effects. The first one is that uh, you you get indexation or dollarization, and then if you get dollarization, you you have a a, a problem with your lender of last resort. And then, and therefore, there's that concern for the financial stability in it. And then the second one is that as uh, peso markets disappear, the private sector doesn't have the main tool they need to hedge against uh, exchange rate risk. And then you have an incomplete market problem. And maybe if I can add to that, because I was interested uh, in this question for a while. So empirically, it seems to be the case also for the US that there's uh, a higher level of inflation is associated with a considerably higher volatility of inflation. And then, of course, if you have nominal contracts, that might have implications for financial stability, right? So maybe that could be a way. So so do you think from the experience of, of uh, Europe, why that, that, that could also matter, higher inflation volatility creating financial turbulence somehow or not? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much, Rafa. Uh, if we would like to think about the, the, an optimal level of competition or concentration in the banking system, what what your results will tell us? Of course, it's not a complete competition, I, but it's, it's that monopoly. I, I think that uh, um, the I mean, if you believe that what is driving risk taking by banks is what is capturing this model, then uh, it, it clearly uh, points out to the fact that some degree of market power is good from a welfare perspective, because it incentivizes banks to uh, do more monitoring effort. And therefore, this is, has a net uh, uh, benefit on, on whatever measure of welfare you do, do here. Now, so in a way, this is uh, in line with what uh, Xavier Vives has uh, argued in a fairly recent book that he published, uh, which had these little pigs in the cover. I don't remember the title of the, of the book, but I remember the, the little pigs. Uh, and, and 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 so basically, what it, what he's arguing is that uh, competition policy uh, should uh, maybe should uh, I mean I mean maybe maybe I, I put it in a, in a very blunt way. I mean, should be special for the financial sector in the sense that uh, you should not uh, think that uh, higher competition is always going to be good, and therefore some sort of. Uh, on the other hand, what uh, we have seen uh, in the recent years uh, in, in many countries uh, is that, uh, well, I mean, the herfindal keeps going up, uh, and uh, so maybe we've overdone it, right? So, I mean, who knows? Uh, but uh, that's uh, something that is a is is a is an important point. I guess that if you talk to competition economists, they would strongly disagree uh, because they would say that uh, uh, you should uh, enforce uh, uh, whatever uh, sort of policies have been established for the entire uh, economic system. But uh, I mean, I think that there is uh, a, a, an argument here that could uh, be used to defend that uh, maybe. Uh, you should be careful in the pursuit of, of competition. On the other hand, I mean, uh, I mean, this is a model of, of banks and 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 and, and uh, sort of uh, 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 sort of uh, competing uh, financial markets. Then, I mean, a question that uh, you may want to uh, consider is that perhaps uh, is not through the. Uh, the, the relevant measure of competition is not what happens within the banking system, but also what Yanshal mentioned, the shadow banks and, and, and the way in which they, they can operate uh, uh, on the edges of the regulated financial system and providing credit uh, and, and therefore uh, doing some of the things. And maybe the, the effect of this uh, competition from these uh, guys will, will be sufficient to check the uh, increased market power in terms of the uh, banking system. I don't know. I mean, this is uh, some, this is this is indeed not the nominal stuff, but this is something that uh, I would like to explore going forward. We are on time, almost there. So, thank you, Rafael, for your presentation and the discussion. I invite you all to lunch, and we are going back here at two p.m. to finish with the last session.
waiting for the, the end of the extra time in Spain, Morocco. <laughs> Let's uh, resume the program and start the last session uh, of the workshop. Now the pleasure to receive uh, Lucas to talk about the role of restructuring in banks, uh, merger and acquisition, evidence from branch level data. Lucas, it's yours. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. First, thank you for including the, the, the paper here. Uh, this joint paper with Bernardo, who is also here. This is our last explosive paper here. We are going to we are going to focus here on on our older literature on the effects of pink emanates. And what we are going to do here from most of the literature is that we are going to focus on the restructuring of the bank of the bank branches after the emanates. So these like bank m uh, are a focus of attention, both of regulators and also academics. While the regulators, the concern is much more about if the anti-competitive effects of, the, of these m outweigh the gains of the efficiency and the stability. On the side of the academics, uh, bank m are basically widely used as a shock or instrument or changes in the local uh, market concentration and also like an instrument for bank branches closures. So, but we know that bank branches, they are, they come with other important ch changes in the uh, in the banking structure, right? So these banks, they they are going to likely restructuring the, uh, the factors of production. They are going to change the corporate control and or they are going to change the management practices and other things, right? But although we know that this happens in reality, there is scant evidence on, on the restriction process and its effects on, on, on banks. So what we are going to do here is to exploit our rich financial and labor information at the branch level uh, before and after the consolidations in order to study how banks uh, restructure the resources uh, post-merger, and what are the effects of the restructuring in the value creation of the banks, and also the, the, the provision of financial service that go beyond the, the market power uh, gains. No, 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 this, this is like, yeah, I'm going to talk in, in a while. These are like basically two M&As that happened in Brazil after, after the great financial crisis, yeah. So there is this vast literature on, on the adverse effects of M&As due to increase in mar uh, uh, increases in the market concentration. We are not going to talk about that. We are, we are, we are going to focus more on like trying to quantify the effects, the efficiency gains caused by, by the M&As. Uh, because this is something that's not really in the literature. There are like two or three papers here that provide some evidence, all at the all using data at the the bank aggregate level, not like more disaggregate data. While in other industries we have uh, some evidence uh, using branch level data, and we are going to complement the literature by using this branch level information in order to disentangle. The efficiency gains from from the other like uh, gains from the from gains from market power. Uh, and why why papers don't do that, right? Why they don't focus on on the increasing the in the efficiency gains because it's very hard to decompose uh, efficiency gains and, and market power gains, right? Uh, and this is especially true because of the lack of plant level data. So we are going to exploit here the, 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 the plant level data in order to be able to decompose the, the effects from efficiency gains from the effects of uh, market power gains. And I'm going to talk in a while on uh, how we are going to do that using the, the plant level data. So we are also going to contribute to the literature on the evidence of the heterogeneous responses of target and acquire banks because there is this, uh, this uh, evidence uh, in several countries that uh, clients from the target and acquire banks, they, they respond very differently to, to 
to these MAs, we are going to provide some mechanisms on why this is the case for, for the Brazilian case. Uh, and we are also going to contribute to the new literature in mostly labor that uh, talks about the allocation of uh, talent uh, across plants uh, after MAs. And this is important because there is this like very extensive literature talking about what are the effects of law and officers and the talent of the law and officers in lending provision. Although we have that, we don't we don't have much evidence on what happens after the MAs in terms of the allocation of the law and officers and what would be the the positive effects of the of this reallocation of law and officers across branches, right? We are also going to contribute to the literature by providing some evidence of uh, of the allocation of funding, because allocation of funding in in like in in other industries is very hard to reallocate capital across plants, right? But in the banking sector, you have a sense that's going to be very very easy for the banks to just reallocate funding inside the 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 the, the branch network that they have, right? So we are also going to contribute on that front. Just a summary of the findings that, that we have here. Uh, what we see is that the conglomerates uh, increase lending supply at the acquirer branches, uh, whereas they, they decrease the, 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 the lending supply in target branches. So even controlling for local time varying shocks uh, that are like that control for, for demand effects and controlling for, for market power gains, we have that uh, acquire branches, they increase credit supply while target branches decrease credit supply. And why this happens, we are going to provide some evidence that this is because of the relocation of resources along the, the branch network. We are going to show that employment and uh, loan officers, like skill loan officers are internally transferred to acquire branches and funding is also relocated to acquire branches. We also show that these branches they increase uh, profitability, but the sort the, the like the mechanism behind the, the increase in the profitability is very different for acquire and target branches. While we see in the acquire branches that uh, the increase in the profitability is due to a higher lending productivity, uh, the increase in the profitability of the target branches are just due to to uh, cost cutting of the of these branches. So just to give like a sense of the of the of the banking sector in Brazil uh, before the global financial crisis, the ten Brazil has a very concentrated uh, banking sector. The ten largest commercial banks have more than eighty percent of the total assets, total credit, and total deposits. The two largest banks, uh, the the two largest government banks, account for almost one third of the. Of the uh, of the assets in the in the commercial banks, and most of these very like uh, large banks that hold most of the of the assets in the system are very large with more than one thousand branches. Uh, some have some of them having more than three thousand branches. So, what we are going to talk here is about a very concentrated market, a market in which the banks are very large, and we are considered just these uh, bank MNAs that happen with banks that are very, very large. And this is also important to the setting that we are going to exploit the, on, the, on the reallocation of resources because they are large branches so they can really engage in, in the reallocation of the, of the resources. And basically in Brazil, what happened is that if we look this paper from Kayaza, they, they report that following the 2007 uh, Following 2007, the banking sector around the world experienced a large increase in the M&A activity, and Brazil was not different. Brazil was experienced the same kind of like wave of of uh, of M&As and consolidation. So between uh, 2007 and 2008, uh, these consolidations accounted for more than one third of the of the whole system. So these were like very important consolidations in the. In the Brazilian banking system that happened at the time, and they and they are driven by the the, the great financial crisis. They are not driven by some specific uh, characteristics of these banks. So we are going to exploit this uh, shock to caused by the great financial crisis to see what happens to these to these banks after demanding. 
So the data that we are going to, employ, to, to use here, it's like uh, uh, we, we are going to use data at the branch level. The first set of data is employer-employer mesh data, which have information about the, the, the wage of all the, the employees, the tenure of the employees, education, occupation, uh, and all of that. So just like a regular employer-employer mesh data. And we also have, and importantly here, we have we have financial information at the branch level, which includes balance sheet information such as deposits, uh, loans, and but also importantly, uh, income statement information such as revenues and costs of these bank branches. And what's very important here is that we are all we are also able to to match these unique identifiers, so we can identify the bank branches before and after the MA with just one identifier, so we can follow these uh, bank branches before and after this uh, M&A. So we, we are going to exploit this unique identifier to, to, to see what happens to the branches before and after, right? So basically, our, our empirical strategy is going to be a difference in difference around the consolidations. And, and with this difference in difference, we face several potential problems of identification, the effects of the of the market power gains, right? Uh, like some possible differences uh, between the banks that went through consolidations and the banks that did not go through consolidations, right? And we can also have some unobserved uh, demand effect at the local level. So I'm going to, to go over here and talk about how we solve these three different problems that we have here. So first, how we control for market power gains. Uh, we have like very, like these bank branches are in different uh, municipalities in, in the country, right? So one possibility is that we are in municipality A, in, in municipality A, in which the target branch has 3% and the acquired branch has 10%, right? And we also have these control bank branches, right? When these two banks that are the target and the acquire, they consolidate, they are going to have 13% of the, of the market power at the local level, right? So they are going to experience a small increase in the, in the market power at the local level. But they are also go through like some kind of consolidation, right? Another possibility is that, that, one in, that the target and the acquire have 30% each, after the consolidation, they have 60%. So what they are going to enjoy is a very large increase in the market power at the local level. And they are also engaging in restructuring, right? A third possibility is that we have just a target branch. And we have a control branch. So there is no increase in the market power uh, at the local level, but we still have the, the, the restructuring part is still there, right? So we are going to exploit differences in, in, in like, if the market is overlap between target and acquire, and also the size of the increase in the market power if they are both present at the local level. And what we are going to also exploit are different effects for acquire and target branches in order to decompose these effects of the relocation. Yeah, so, so basically here, the, the acquired and the target are going to be here before and after the consolidation, but there is no gains in terms of market power because your market share is going to be basically the same before and after the consolidation, right? So there is no really not, not like local level gains from, from this, this consolidation, right? Because you just have the target or the acquire so it's not that your market power is increasing because you have both together, right? No, but, but there is no zero from set because what we are going to do here is compare the same branch before and after the consolidation, right? So the branch is there. Yeah, nothing happens because the branch is still there. Yeah. 
So basically, so the second problem that we have is that probably these banks are very different, right? The banks that went through consolidations and the bank that did not go over the consolidations, they are probably very different. So what we do here is that we have first the two uh, conglomerates that were treated in 2007 and 2008. And what we do is that we just compare this uh, this conglomerate with the other banks that went through a consolidation in 2016. So they're going to go over a consolidation, but just after the period of time that we're going to analyze. So probably they are more likely to be to be more similar because they, they also went through consolidation, but after the period that we're going to analyze. Importantly, we are just focusing here on private banks. Uh, there are like a lot of the evidence in Brazil that during the, 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 the great financial crisis, uh, the, the, the way that the, the public banks were acting was totally different than the private banks. So we are not going to consider the public banks and just the private ones. Uh, it's also important to highlight here that the timing of the effects that we are going to see here are also very important because these market power gains they, they are almost instantaneous, right? You have like an increase in the market power gains, you can charge more for your clients, so this is going to be instantaneous. While the restructuring, there is like some process of restructuring uh, the, the employees to other branches and all of that, so these restructuring parts would take some time and we are going to show that, that we have that on the data also. So just uh, descriptive statistics on what we have here. Uh, basically, these bank these bank branches both the control, the control and the target, the control target and acquire are very similar both on on branch assets, branch employees. So the size is very similar. Uh, the tertiary education of of the employees are very similar, but there are like two very important differences among target and acquire. The acquire, the acquire seems to be, uh, seems to have uh, loan officers that are more skewed. So like the skew of the loan officers, we can discuss a little bit how we calculate that, but the skew of the loan officers of the acquire seems to be a bit smaller than, than the, the control group. So it seems that they, they, they don't have very skewful like loan officers. It's also important here that the, the lending per worker of the targets are also a bit higher. So our whole hypothesis here is that this relocation was really important part of it because there, was, there are differences be, between the acquire and the target. That's why, that's why you have, we have this matching, right? One bank is acquiring the other one to have these very skillful like law and officers and to increase the 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 lending uh, the lending productivity. So what we are going to do here in the end, we are going to employ this stack difference in differences, in which we are interested in the different effects among targets and acquire branches. We are going to control for possible uh, uh, market power gains by controlling for the fact that the location, was, the location was an overlap between the target and acquire, and also the total market share of the target and the acquire before the, the, the consolidation. We are also go, going to control for time varying demand uh, factors by controlling for municipalities by time fixed effects. And then we are going to control also for these, for uh, branch fixed effects and also branch uh, branch characteristics by time, fixed effects are to to incorporate that different branches can react differently to the to the to the MN. So the first thing that we have here is that the the effect on lending is negative for the targets, while it's positive for the acquirer. And this is something that the whole literature analyzing uh, uh, target and acquire branches had already. They suffer when uh, M and A happens, and the, the 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 clients of the of the acquire they they benefit from 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 a, a consolidation. But what we are going to do here is to because these effects are like driven by two different things here, right? 
the intensive margin and the extensive margin. So what we, we have here is that the likelihood of closing a branch is decreases for a choir and increases for the target. But these effects are much smaller than the contraction in lending supply by the, the branches that were always, uh, were always like active in our data sets. So we focus just on the branches that were there for the whole period of time. And these effects are much bigger, both in, in increasing the lending supply in the acquire and decreasing the lending supply in the, in the target. So we are not going to consider these branches that close down because these effects are pretty small. We are just going to consider these, uh, these, these branches that survive uh, uh, after the MA to consider what, to see what happens in terms of, of their allocation. Yes. So this is my last slide. My last slide, I'm going to show that, that these, these effects here prevail over these effects here. So if, if you believe, so basically they're going, they going to form a unique bank. So they're going to share all the information. But if you believe that the loan officer has a specific knowledge about the clients, what we're going to show here is that basically we are like the, 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 the loan officers from the, from the target are going to the acquire. So if they, if they carry some kind of like expertise which is not related to the client itself. It's more a expertise on, on then the, the, your, the experience are an increase in the, in the lending. But if it's like just something specific to the client, then we would see like, uh, we would, it, it would be different because the client would not be the same in different branches, right? So what we are going to show here is, is that it seems that the, the fact is just that they are more skillful on providing lending to the clients, not to providing lending to a specific uh, client. Maybe this is true, but what we are going to show here is that all the effects are, 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 are not, are actually the opposites in the two branches. So if you, what you are saying is true, we would see like similar effects on both sides, not like opposite effects in, 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 in these branches, but maybe, maybe it's not so clear, but, but we can discuss later. First, what we're going to focus here in, is on the labor restriction. What we see is that the number of employees, so even so here we have specifications with and without market power controls. They are more or less the same here. But what we see is that employees in the in the target uh, in the target branch has decreased, and the employees in the acquired branch increase. And the, the, these decrease in the target branches are due to uh, a mixture of net internal transfers and and uh, net uh, hirings from from other uh, banks, right? So it seems that's a mixture of these two effects here. While the results that we we see on the acquire are just due to higher uh, net transfers. So so what we have here is really that that uh, the, the the new conglomerates is just like transferring good employees to to acquire branches. Okay. How powerful are uh, unions of workers in, in Brazil? The, the unions of workers, how powerful are they? They are very powerful. I would say more on the public banks than on the private ones. Um, 
We don't have much information on on the types of measures after, but in general, what, what happens is that when we have these consolidations, you have kind of an agreement with the, yeah. Precisely, that's yeah. my, my point, because if, if looking at, at your at your paragraphs, it seems that there is a net destruction of employment. Yeah, that's true, okay? that's true. So for that, it's, it's, it's important how powerful are unions in order to preserve this. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, this result is very specific to Brazil, and I don't want to, to say that would be the same in the US, but but uh, it, it, it can be that the case, but I think there, there's, we still see some net hiring here, right? So they are not so powerful. There is some space to, to, to lay off uh, people, right? Then what happens in terms of the employed the employee's ability? What we do here is like lay, use like the labor literature in which we can compose the fixed effects of the of the branches, some characteristics of the workers, uh, in order to decompose what's the innate uh, skill of the worker and what's the 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 other components like uh, experience, occupation, all of that. So here, what we do is that. We compute the, the, the ability of the workers uh, and we uh, we calculate the average ability of the workers for these different branches. What we find is that we have like some results that the employee's ability go up. But if we look on the, uh, if we decompose between loan officers and other employees, what we see is a very, Positive, uh, positive and very significant effect on the ability of the of the loan officers, but no effects in terms of the of the ability of the of the other employees, both as the target and the and, and the acquire ratio. So it seems that there is a relocation of labor, and this relocation of labor is is going to the acquire, but just a very skillful like loan officers are going to the acquire. What we do next is like to, to try to see what happens if, if this increase in the in the in the lending supply is due to differences in deposits or like uh, differences in like uh, the the internal capital markets of the banks. So what we see is that the deposits of the acquire also go up, while the deposits of the of the target stay more or less the same. So not like Seems that deposit is going up, but also the lending to deposits is going up. So they're providing, given the same amount of, of deposits that they have today, they're providing more credit. We also have some results here that they acquire. So basically, these are the total assets from the branches that are in the internal capital markets of the banks. So what we do here is a ratio between the amount of the branches how much the branches have in the internal capital markets divided by the total deposit. And what we see is that there is also like less uh, deposits of the target uh, of the acquire in the internal capital markets. So there is also a relocation of funding here. Uh, more funding stays in the branches and not in the internal capital markets and it's used in other branches of the conglomerate, right? Finally, what we, we, we show here is like, what are the effects of the restructuring in terms of productivity, right? So we basically look here for lending to lending per employee, deposits per employee, and also the, the profits per employee at the branch level. What we see here is basically that lending to deposits go up both to the target and the acquire. Deposits seem to go up just like the productivity of the deposit seems to go up just for the, the acquire. But when we look to the, prof, to the profitability per worker at, at, the, at the target and the acquire, what we see is that the profitability goes, the, the productivity uh, of the branch goes up both at the target and also the, at the acquire. So it's not that decreasing the credit supply at the target branch came at a cost for the bank. It's not, this is not the case here. So why we have that? There is no increased pro, pro, uh, uh, productivity here in 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 uh, providing credit or like getting more deposits. So what's going on here? 
What we do is that we rely on the information about the revenues, the costs, and the cost of the, of the bank branches. And what we see is that revenues are going up, they acquire. So while the, 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 the costs are also going up in the, in the acquire, they, they, are, they still have like a positive effect in the profitability of these of this, uh, of this bank, uh, bank branches. So the acquire increases the revenues much more than increases the cost. That's why we, we see this increase in the profitability per worker. While what we see at the, at, at the targets is that the revenues do not change much, but the, the cost of, the, of, of these branches go down. So it seems that the increased productivity of the of the of the of the target branches are due to uh, to cutting costs of the of the target branches. And then we go, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised that you have such detailed information about uh, revenues, costs, uh, and profits at the level of a branch, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't it surprising? I mean, yeah, it's surprising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We like so it's, the, it's very, the, it's very detailed here. Yeah. So these are reporting uh, banks reporting to the central bank uh, all these uh, information yeah. and this public data. So it was around there, and people are not using. Related to this uh, uh, comment, it's, it's, it's quite surprising to see, I guess, for European or from the European perspective, because I'd have expected that at least in the short term, cost cycle going up, because restructuring is costly. If you lay off people, you have to find deals with unions that are very expensive in the short term. You have uh, IT system transformations that drag on for many, many years. So, yeah, I was wondering how you think about that and whether the cost numbers are actually reliable. So, so that's that's a good point. So here, what we have are just like the costs incurred by the bank branches. So we are taking all the headquarters out of it. So that's true. It, it can be that the, the IT costs go up, or they are paying for layoff to all these people. We we are taking out the headquarters, so we are not considering this this part. So it's just like the. The, the service provided is just the cost and the revenues of the of the service provided by the branch. That's 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 totally true. I just have two slides, so that's it. Do you know Bernard? Uh, yeah, we, we, that's a good point. Yeah, that, that, that can be the case. Again, maybe it's not here because we are taking out the headquarters. But it can be, it can be, that's true. Then what we finally do is like, we are, we are, we are going to see what, what are the effects prevailing in, in, in terms of lending supply, right? If there are the effects of closing the branch or if there are the effects of like uh, the, 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 the increased productivity of providing lending. So what we do is that we aggregate all the information that we have uh, at, the uh, at the conglomerate city level. So then what we have differently is that before we had uh, each line was a bank branch. Now we have uh, uh, all the conglomerates format uh, all the three conglomerates that were formed in 2006, 2008, and the synthetic uh, conglomerates formed in 2016. And when, then we compared the conglomerate, the, we used the, the control in 2016 at the conglomerate level. So this aggregation of the target and acquired branches at the, at the same city. And what we, what we show is that lending goes up, it seems to go up a bit less in overlapping markets. And this is what people like usually compare overlapping and overlapping market. What we are showing here is that like MA is increasing lending, but it seems that the increase is not so big for overlapping markets. So
estimating the whole like effect of the m &A, we are just focusing here on a specific aspect. I, I would say that it's basically at the target level is a loss of soft information caused by this transition of uh, skillful uh, people. And this might explain the effect of the target, not necessarily at the level of the acquire. Yeah, but it could be just that they know that the they know that the loan officers at the target are good. Then they transfer to the acquire. They make more money at the target, even though they are not providing more credits, right? So it could be just a rational like explanation of that, right? Now, uh, it wasn't clear to me uh, what's the timing of your uh, estimated equation, because I would have thought that the effect of the M&As on employment, uh, et cetera, is sort of delayed. I mean, it's, it's not something that happens uh, in a contemporaneous manner, mm -hmm. but something that happens uh, in the subsequent years, right? Mm -hmm. But when, I mean, yeah, the, it was clear here, but, but in the, uh, the, the uh, uh, results, uh, the econometric results, wh what is it that you are reporting? So we are just reporting here the average effect. We do have the dynamic effects like this one for the other variables. It's just like for presentational purposes, I'm not talking much about that. But in the paper, we have all the dynamic effects there. And they, they seem to corroborate with the, our story. But, but, but maybe we need to change that on the presentation. Thank you for the comment. Do you have detailed information on the risk of the branches? Non-performing loans or things like that? We have no, uh, we have loan provision. The problem is that one of the banks that we have here in the consolidation, maybe more, I, I, I think it's just one. It allocates all the, 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 the loan provision at their headquarter. So we cannot estimate effects because it's allocated all in the headquarters. And I think it's a control group. So we cannot use this specific variable. Yeah. It's, it's a pity because one is interesting to see also the, 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 the effect of risk taking, for example, <laughs> and related to Rafa's presentation here, maybe you have a way to test some of the implications. You you have a change in market power, and if you can relate that with risk taking, it would be maybe a way of testing the, the, the empirical implication of Rafa also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can we can do that for we can do that for I think some banks we can do that use the 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 exogenous let's say exogenous condition of the of the yeah. merger and acquisition. There is an exogenous variation in, in in concentration market power in that ratio. Sure, thank you, thank you so for the maybe you, you can you can exploit that still. More comments. So Lucas, now when you look at the profitability um, of the target bank, now before the day zero, I mean, I, I would imagine that these target banks are banks in trouble with some sort of uh, problems of profitability. Do you see anything uh, in terms of, well, I'm actually you look at deviations from the target date, right? So it's, it's not clear. So. So here is a bit, it's a bit different. So what happened is that one of the one of the MAs was due to like liquid shortage of all like they are both like domestic banks that suffered a shortage of liquidity during the great financial crisis. So that's why they merged. The other case is like ABN, uh, ABN being acquired by Santander in Netherlands. So it's not related to the bank in Brazil, it's more related to, so that, that's, we maybe we need to add that to the presentation that explain that, that the MA seems that's not just because of, of course they are targeting a specific bank that complements their like, their, uh, their operation, but was not really due to bad management of the target. Thank you.
And for the last presentation of today and the, this year's workshop, we have the pleasure to receive Rasband to talk about uh, mortgage defaults. Hey, um, thank you, first of all, the organizers for including the paper in uh, in the program. It was uh, lovely to be back to Montevideo and see so many familiar faces. And uh, thank you to all of you surviving till uh, till the very last paper. Much appreciated. Um, so um, this uh, is a joint work with uh, Alin, uh, Anka, and uh, Radu from National Bank of Romania. Uh, and the paper uh, you'll hear again about uh, defaults, different type of uh, defaults, uh, not the corporate defaults, but mortgage defaults. Uh, given the fact that all of us uh, we work uh, and we still love working at the central bank, the usual disclaimer uh, uh, applies. I, I will start with a very short uh, motivation. Uh, I will try to be straightforward, uh, highlighting the main questions and the empirical setup mainly and the, the result uh, we have uh, uh, in the paper. So we had many uh, real estate uh, uh, crises across the world, but in particular, the global financial crisis reveal the fact that mortgage delinquencies and foreclosure might have serious implications both for affected households and for financial stability. And mortgage debt in the aftermath of the crisis was identified as one of the amplifier of spillover effects of the real economy. Delinquencies increased in the real estate, solvency of lending institutions went down, and as a result of this, their capacity to extend lending uh, was, was compromised. Now, um, evidence suggests that borrowers on both sides of the Atlantic defaulted on their mortgage obligations. Nevertheless, uh, was a clear pattern. Basically, default rates in Europe were markedly lower than in the United States. And one key reason explaining this pattern is the differences between the European and US mortgage loans. Uh, what I mean by this, mortgages in all the European countries are recourse, while in contrast, uh, in many U.S. states, in particular the largest one, uh, these uh, mortgages, uh, mortgage loans are non-recourse. For those not familiar with recourse, recourse, what this means, uh, in a recourse jurisdictions, if the market value of a borrower defaulting uh, following the foreclosure um, uh, procedure is lower than the mortgage debt, basically the lender is entitled to claim future income of, of the borrower. So the opposite happens in, in a non-recourse non case. Argu arg arguably, the borrower's limited liability in these non-recourse uh, jurisdictions might contribute to a higher likelihood of mortgage default. Now, uh, understanding this relationship be between recourse procedures and borrower default is important, both for policymakers, but also for the lending financial institution. And we can argue that there is a current relevance in still in, in many countries, um, there are still active or, or just partially relaxed all those moratoria on the on the on the uh, payments during the COVID crisis, and still um, basically this credit forbearance and the potential impact on delinquencies in the future is uh, is an open uh, unknown. Now, is an important question. Yet most of the previous studies, because we are not the first looking at this uh, uh, this topic, uh, took a static approach, meaning what they contrast. Um, what happened in uh, recourse and non-recourse states and jurisdictions. Uh, there is not much uh, evidence um, uh, regarding uh, time variation in recourse procedures. So basically, we didn't experience across the world many instances when one country switched from one type of uh, 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 law to, to another. So we, we know relatively little what happens in a dynamic setting. Here we come with the paper and we ask two very simple questions. So the first one, how does a change in recourse legislation, the direction being from recourse, so basically the lender can claim future income in case of default, the, the law is changed to non-recourse, might affect the incidence of mortgage default. And once we answer this question, we try to understand whether borrowers responded strategically to this change in legislation. So we try to find evidence from strategic behavior. What we do? Um, we exploit the event of a specific law introduced in Romania, so-called Datuin Solutum, giving in payment, which basically um, changed the status of existing, not only the new mortgages, existing mortgages on the bank balance sheet overnight from recourse to non-recourse. So we use this event, then we identify borrowers who defaulted on their obligations before the introduction of the law, after, and also who are those requesting to give in payment and look at their characteristics. 
Um, we consider as a working definition a mortgage being delinquent when it is 90 days uh, past, uh, past due. Once the second question, we try to assess potential asymmetry effects of several borrower and loan characteristics on mortgage default under the new recourse regime. So although we have uh, a battery of controls that are continuous variables, we create groups to identify these asymmetric effects. I will explain this in a moment. What we find the main result, switching from recourse to non-recourse, as intuitively we expected, lead to a, an immediate quarter after the change in the, uh, uh, in the law, 60% increase in the average prob probability of default for borrowers that could apply. I will explain in a moment what this means. Uh, with respect to the second question, we observe the strongest effects on non-repayment for less financially constrained borrowers, not this, the, those with higher income and lower debt, uh, arguably those who could afford to pay their mortgage obligation, and at the same time, those with uh, large negative equity. So these are the main uh, main results. Just to give uh, a hint what the law meant and how it was introduced and how long it was active, so the law was introduced in end of April 2016 and was... Um, One minor uh, question. Uh, what was non-recourse? The, the bank cannot go to the income of the... Exactly. So the, basically, if I have a mortgage uh, and um, I decide to, to not to pay anymore, I simply give the ownership back to the bank, I walk away. I do not have any deficiency judgment. So the bank will not give me nothing back. If I pay something, I am not responsible for any loss the bank might incur on, on, on the debt. Yes. Is, is it clear or I went too far or explain the distinction? Okay. So the law was introduced end of April 2016, was announced as a kind of a social program for distressed borrowers. And what was very important from the very beginning, the eligibility criteria. So all new, but also existing loans, so we have like this retroactive applicability, retail loans, so no corporate loans at all there, with a real estate guarantee. So basically the primary collateral was used as a dwelling and with some restrictions. So basically the loan should be lower than 250,000 euros, which is a very large loan for that period in Romania. Uh, and also, a certain category of loans that benefit of uh, government uh, guarantees, so-called first home loans, were excluded. So basically, this gives us a not very nice setup because we have a large type of standard loans that will be able to apply for this uh, uh, new, new law. In the same time, we have a control group, some loans that cannot apply, and we have a clear change in the, in, in the policy. With respect to the timeline, so the law was introduced um, with a permanent character. As I said, came into force in May 2016. Nevertheless, the banks comply, uh, in particular regarding the aspect of this retroactive applicability and no eligibility criteria. So it was no question of if you have problems, you can uh, you can give up your payment. What happened in the end in January 2017, the law was declared unconstitutional. So it's a very short lead. We have a clear time period when the law is active, and anybody could could benefit benefit within the quotes on the law. Related to this legislation, um, has there been a change uh, also in the general bankruptcy, private bankruptcy procedures? Uh, is it very costly to to go uh, into private bankruptcy? Uh, you know, um, there, in Romania, there is no bank personal bankruptcy uh, laws in many other countries, so you cannot default and have a complete wipe up of your uh, of your um, obligations. If, if this is what what it means. I or you, you refer to the bankruptcy procedures and yeah, that there's uh, some some forgiving and uh, no some forgetting no exactly so something that can counterbalance this yeah. no it was not and, such a law and related to the forgetting so uh, is it the case if I uh, basically walk away from my house uh, from my mortgage uh, uh, that there is a consequence for my credit record? Well, if you, if you do this, if you default. When you, if there is a recourse procedure, of course, this is recording the credit register that we use as the information. Once this is legal, is no uh, no no restriction will have no no constraints attached. So being in a non-recourse means it's legal to walk away of your payment obligation for a mortgage. So basically, there is no other constraint. Maybe there is a note. The bank will make a note. Yeah, this this individual. Gave up uh, the, the the payment, didn't didn't pay the debt, but there is no other constraints attached with respect to you are not able to borrow from another lender. 
in the I see because in the US you can walk away, but then there's implication for your credit score, right? There is an implication for the credit score. Well, but it's not so strict, basically. You have an information that is kept for at least five years, indeed, that you apply for this, but I'm not aware of the fact that you, your credit score will be affected negatively. But maybe it's my, my, my lack of knowledge. Okay. Well, what was the rationale for this law? I mean, it's, it's in particular, the fact that it uh, was applying to the large loans. I mean, I can imagine that a populist government would say, yes, let's do that for the poorer guys. Exactly. But why do it for the richer guys? So your intuition is correct. So the, the laws proposed and were massively voted by a populist government. Now, um, when I will describe a little bit more, so the, the period, April 2016, this is coming, okay, after the, the global financial crisis, and this hit the real estate market in Romania somewhere around 2009, 2010. So a lot of defaults happened at that moment. And then was another important aspect. Many loans in Central Eastern Europe, starting with something like 2012, 2013, till almost 2015, were graded in Swiss francs. Swiss franc was pegged. They were offering very competitive interest rates. 2015, January, was this unpegged basically? The affordability decreased for most of the borrowers. And of course, some banks were forced, I will explain in a moment, to, to, to switch the loans at a predetermined rate, not, not to completely absorb the borrowers, completely absorb the losses, but also to share with the bank. And at that moment, the populist government came and said, okay, but maybe there are other borrowers that we don't know about. Let's do this. And all those distressed borrowers will be able to give in payment. So the, how do you say, informal uh, approach was, uh, you know, informal motivation was, okay, banks also behave reckless, given the fact that they granted so many Swiss franc loans without properly informing the, uh, their clients. But was this uh, indeed this political aspect in terms of who proposed the law? I go further. Uh, now, just to give a hint, what, what, what in terms of non performing loans and probability of default is meant with the raw data. So we could see here when the law is introduced, basically for those loans, standard loans that would qualify, the ratio of non performing loans increased quickly and then remain elevated. But then, as soon as we're getting closer to the unconstitutional moment, uh, it started to decrease. While for the other role that they couldn't apply, the first home, those that enjoy government subsidies stay more or less flat. And if we look at probability of default, this also happens. So the default probability, they, they follow parallel trends. So look at the scale. But still, the first home loans were much safer than these standard loans. But immediately when the law was introduced, the probability of default jump here. Okay. So this is in terms of what, what happened across time. Um, now, I, I will not tell much about the, the literature uh, because I, I will not be able to make justice. There is a huge literature focusing on mortgage default, both theoretical and empirical. Just my reading of the literature, there are different theories that can be structured on these uh, five categories with respect to uh, what, uh, what can explain default. So we have theories focusing on ability to pay, simply saying that individuals default involuntarily when they are un unable to meet current payments. We have strategic default theories suggesting that households choose to default voluntarily after a rational analysis of future costs and benefits. Um, then we have a combination of both to say, okay, uh, it might be that uh, you do not have the ability to pay. Uh, what might cause this or could be a dual trigger? So basically you have a combination of high indebtedness and negative equity that might lead to default. Of course, what also matters is the quality of the judicial pro uh, 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 process and the institutional quality, the laws basically governing these recourse, non recourse, and also the macroeconomic factors. So this is a nutshell what the literature says about uh, potential drivers of, uh, of, uh, of default. Now, we also built, before we jump into, into an empirical exercise, just to give a flavor, we also built uh, a, a very simple stylized theoretical framework trying to identify and to create predictions for our, our empirical exercise under which conditions solvent borrowers, which will be the focus of our uh, exercise, will have incentives to default on their mortgages obligations. So basically, we, we compare and we look 
um, uh, when the borrower will choose to default and not, and then we'll compare states when the recourse is in place versus known recourse. So some, something that came out uh, for, from this model, strategic default is less attractive under stricter recourse legislation, is intuitive because then the bank might be able to recover things. Borrowers will benefit from strategic default are proportional to negative equity. So basically larger, the difference between the market value of the house and how much you have to be paid, stronger incentive you have to default because you can keep more of the money and don't pay back to the bank. Also, higher strategic incentives uh, for wealthier borrowers. And here uh, we explain this by considering that the wealthier borrowers, uh, they have a kind of lower opportunity cost of default. They do not depend on borrowing for future consumption. While poor individuals, once they default, uh, there is negative information about them. So this opportunity cost of default is very large. In the same time, strategic default is more attractive for higher outstanding mortgage balances because in this case, the payoff from default is increased. So these are some, some um, uh, elements that, um, um, that we deliver in this uh, stylized framework and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll test that, uh, with the data. A few words about the data. We have loan level information from uh, National Bank of Romania Credit Registry. Basically, we have information uh, about all the mortgages, about 4,500 euros. These are outstanding, yes. Uh, on the bank balance sheet, something like 99% of the existing loans. We create quarterly vintages from December 2014 to June 2016. We have information about uh, each loan characteristic. Um, what type of information is there? We have information about loan size, the currency, current loan delay, residual maturity, current interest rate. Uh, most of the loans in Romania are with variable interest rates, something like 90%. Uh, also originating bank and the year of origination. And we complement this data with information uh, regarding individual borrowers from uh, Ministry of Finance. And this allow us to compute affordability indicators, for example, debt service to income, considering all the exposure, not only the mortgage, but also consumer loans or any other obligation individual borrower might have. Now, we apply a couple of restrictions to this data set. So first of all, we eliminate borrowers that are already in default because we want to focus on solvent borrowers. Uh, initial stage, we eliminate borrowers from multiple mortgages because this can be speculators or, or investors, but later on we add them in robustness tests and basically observe uh, a slight increase in probability of default for these borrowers, but they don't quite quantitatively affect our result. And also those loans that disappear from bank's balance sheet and we are unable to say why they disappear. Either they, they pay completely or uh, what happened with them. So these are uh, the main um, uh, things that uh, we, we, we restrict the sample. In the end, we have 1.9 million mortgage data points covering 339,000 unique borrowers. One question, uh, these loans that disappear, uh, I mean, are they, they were they performing before disappearing or will for example, are there write-offs uh, from the balance sheet of the... It, it's a mix. Like I can't answer this question. It's a mix, what I know from for my colleagues. So basically, most of them were performing. We suspect that they completely paid. So they were the, they were oh, outstanding. So there are only new loans. So were loans maybe issued in 2003, 2004. But a way, I don't know if it's a credit registry at the, at the loan level or, or operation, but if it's the case that they were paid off there, then you should be, uh, you, you should see like a currency in the payments, like the, 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 the balance should be diminishing until the it's, it disappears. So in, in, mm -hmm. it's a way in order to identify those that are paid versus those that, for example, are written off, which is absolutely different. Again, so I don't, I didn't see the data. I don't know how it's recorded there. My colleagues know, I will ask them. But why this might be important? Because the thing is that I mean, you you are losing, uh, for example, the ones that that are being paid, they they are, they are performing. So it depends at the moment that you do the analysis. I don't know if I would like. No, but to... but they don't matter anymore because if they disappear, maybe because they were performing later on when we do use these vintages to run our exercise when the law is introduced. They are not there anymore to test whether they will become delinquent or not. Yeah. So we can include it, but later on we can't check what happened with them later on. 
Yeah, but if a borrower, it's related with the other point because imagine that you have a borrower that has multiple multiple mortgages. So one of them is being paid in one bank, okay, and maybe in be, another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's okay. I will check. Thank you. So my comments may be related to this, maybe I misunderstood, but um, from a theoretical viewpoint, uh, uh, if the borrower has this threat to walk away, uh, one potential outcome would, could be a debt renegotiation. Maybe that the loan is converted to a new loan with better terms, right? Uh, so I'm wondering how whether that happened frequently and how that would show up in the data. Uh, I agree, this can happen. This is related to this large literature on evergreening, maybe zombie lending. It's something that started to look as unperforming, but then you renegotiate. Maybe officially you don't change the details in the contract, but the contract still goes on. You allow for this. Maybe you give another loan to be able to pay the first loan. Um, but I would say this can happen. We can't check for this, I think. But... Will this affect our results or not? Or will make them stronger? I think it will make them stronger because if you have the positive, so we find evidence for strategic default and we'll see in a moment. Uh, if the, on top of this, you have a lot of this renegotiation, this means there are even more borrowers try to benefit of the law and force the banks into renegotiation. So if we'll be able, I think we'll make the results stronger to be able to control for this, but I don't think we can. We're not going to be able to get to the results. <laughs> um, I was wondering whether this law was anticipated, because if it was anticipated and you have uh, a, a recourse loan, and then uh, you know that uh, next month, uh, then you sort of delay uh, defaulting on the loan, uh, and then you may have the spike, uh, not because of the law, but because of this uh, normal loans that would have defaulted waited until the law was passed. So we need to clean for this anticipation. Um, yeah, I, I can't argue, arguably convince you that this didn't happen. Why? Because there were discussions. The law was voted, was discussed, was like a huge debate, both at the political level and the economical level. So uh, so was anticipated in the case that is possible with like 50-50 chance. Nobody knew how quickly will be or when will uh, will uh, will be implemented, and things actually move pretty fast. So the moment was proposed, all these debates in less than a month was already voted and implemented. So that that was really unexpected. So nobody expected things would move so fast actually, and with a positive decision for for enactment of the law. But this means that there was anticipation. We cannot uh, ignore the fact that maybe there were some people, speculators, who took it, tried to benefit for this uh, uh, period, and then uh, quickly uh, gave it uh, back to the bank. And there's also the anticipation of the uh, decision of the uh, court declaring unconstitutional, because if you know that... This, this, they, we'll, we'll see the effect. So yeah. this is there. I, I will show you. As soon as those discussions started, uh, the probability of default uh, went down. I will show you in a moment. Anticipation there was, was for sure. But before that, we, we didn't see in the data. So if you default it only before the last you didn't No, because it was not, was not there. It was no crack, but when you say yeah. crack, it's for loans. Existing loans. So basically, because if, if we think what can happen, once you change this law, normally you apply to new loans. And there are two types of effects, what the banks will do. Once you introduce this law, the banks will take precautionary actions, will, will lower the LTV, ask for more down payment, such that more skin in the game the borrower will have, less likely to apply for the loan. But the problem was, and all this unconstitutional rule, was that they, they put it for all the loans in the back with no other criteria regarding how many problems you have, maybe you, you lost your income, part of your income. Do you also consider that part that is not? Uh, one more time, what do you mean? So, you have an experts, there is a lawyer, then the, then the Supreme Court said this is not constitutional. Mm -hmm. So, you should have said something going on afterwards. Yeah, yeah. Well, I will show you in a moment. I will show you in a moment. Um, okay. 
So we have this data set, and now quickly, there, there are three main models. I, I will focus on the three main models we estimate. So the first one, the baseline, is a classical different D because we have a, a classical setup. A clear change in the policy and a clear control group and uh, uh, a treatment. Now, what will be the focus? So if we look here, the beta zero will tell us basically whether these standard mortgages that could apply for the loan were riskier before the law was introduced compared with the first home loan that couldn't apply. Then the beta ones, and then here we expect, given what I show you in the figure, the raw data, that, the, that they should be more risky. Now, the beta one will simply say what will happen to the average probability of default of loans that could not apply. They could not apply, so we should see no effect, in, 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 uh, no, no change in the average probability of failure there. And what is the most interesting is the interaction, the beta two, saying that when the law was in place for this period of like uh, four quarters, we should see an increase in probability of default for loans that would apply, the standard mortgage loans. Then we control for borrower and loan characteristics and also for year of origination, so the macroeconomic conditions when the loan is issued, the risk profile of the banks, but also uh, potential differences in the housing market, looking at the county fix effect. Now, the second model is say, I will show you the result here. Uh, we move to the second one and say, okay, in this category of loans that could be applied, we could have an indication who will become later on um, uh, non performing, but looking whether they apply for the law while they were solvent. So, basically, without having any indication of potential failure, all of a sudden they apply for the loan and immediately after they become the lead. We'll do this in this second model. And then, as I'd say, we try to uncover any potential asymmetric effects looking at the borrower and loan characteristics. So basically, again, we have like the dip and dip here in which we control for the period when the law was active. And then we look at a number of borrower characteristics and interact them with the period when the law was active to see whether uh, some borrowers, though they were with higher leverage or those that they have higher income benefit um, uh, more from the law and behave strategically. So these are the main moments and then uh, models and then I will briefly show you the results. So we do this, as I said, borrower and loan. The result for so the first one, this is a bit hard to see, uh, but I will show also a, a better graph. So this is the standard defending. So what the result says, Standard mortgage loans are indeed riskier than the first home before the law was introduced. We didn't see any change after the law was introduced for those loans that could not apply as expected. And now we see a significant increase for those mortgages that could apply, borrowers with mortgages that could apply when the law was active. Then we try to look a little bit more granular to see, okay, we have information that these laws survive for only a few quarters when the impact was higher. And then when, instead of this period, we have dummies for each quarter, so two quarters before and up two quarters after the law is active, what we can see that in the middle of activity, so basically quarter 2016, Q3 and Q4, we have a significant increase in this probability of default. In this, in a figure, and this will answer also uh, Lucas' question. So this is, nothing is changing two quarters before, so maybe it's an anticipation, as you said, Rafa, because they were waiting. All of a sudden, the law is introduced. Probability goes up by 60% and even more. The difference here is almost like it's doubling. And then the discussion started about un unconstitutional aspect is going down. As soon as eliminated, it's coming almost to the same level. While for the law that couldn't apply, there is no change. So clearly, the law induced borrowers that could apply who apply in the quarters when the law is active to take the benefit. So we move one step further and try to understand what is going on and who are the guys. Yeah. But it's worth saying that the switch constitutional, they should be in a moment. But then well, but but here at this moment, they didn't know this. So but, so then this we have quarterly information. So we do not have like granular monthly information to see what happened here in between. So here the discussion started and they had only one quarter to react. But then we have the next information here when the law was, uh, was, was not in place anymore. What happens? So maybe here, yeah, I, I don't know what happened here. So when the discussion started, you're right. Maybe most of those who wanted to benefit quickly 
it is here in the first six months. And I would expect this. Why wait? Why wait longer? So that's that's the how to say the alternative story of the wealth that I mentioned that we can measure. So we can say that wealth is a proxy for financial literacy. So those guys, wealthier guys, they know better how to read the press and the news, and they don't like behaving like this. We cannot measure per se financial literacy. What happens with the laws that apply for this after the law becomes constitutional? What happens? Uh, ah, that's a good point. So because let's... because this is maybe related to, to, to your point. If mm -hmm. they go back to the previous situation, so you, you can see this kind of effect. But if mm -hmm. the, 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 um, the law continues, yeah. I mean, then I, I will try to enter before yeah. it becoming constitution. That's a good question. So we look, most of the requests that happened here were solutions before, so in the next six months, which was a pretty quick procedure. Uh, but yeah, that's a good idea to look what happened at the guys here. So the, the, the last quarter. But the question would be, okay, again, what this will tell us. So one thing that can tell, so the incentive to default was clear. They, they, they become non-performing, they make the request, but it might be that for this, the process of figuring out with the bank what to do because the law was changed will take longer. Maybe some of them were denied. Uh, this is interesting in explaining what happened with those loans, but for our story, it doesn't say much. They, they simply, they, they express already their incentive to default. For strategic aspect you want to capture, I think it's enough. For procedural, I think it's useful to know, actually, and I think it's a very good question. I have to check. I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. Then, with respect to the second exercise, what we see, we see that basically we have a slight spillover when we control for all the borrower and loan characteristics from those that never requested, never applied the loan in terms of default. So, basically, Slight increase, less significant for those borrowers who could apply but did not apply. While those that apply during that period have a strong increase in their probability of default. And then what we can see here in the controls, we have the usual suspect I summarize here, basically low income, high indebtedness, larger mortgage origination, mortgage in foreign currencies, high current LTV, high current interest rate, lead to an increasing probability of default. So basically, we just confirm what the existing literature already showed. And then we move to these asymmetric effects, and we have the two models. The first one looking at the characteristics. So we create groups with respect to income, four categories, those um, about which we don't have precise information from the Ministry of Finance, excluded categories, uh, an income below the uh, medium, then something medium, double medium, and above double medium wage. What we can see, we can see that precisely those guys with the highest income, they increase more the probability of default during the period when the law is active. We interpret this as an indication of uh, increase in um, strategic default incentives. And just to show here, so what happened when we don't control for the period when the law is active, we have the expected result. Higher the income, less the probability of default. We expected this. Now, when the law is introduced and we distinguish between these two periods before the law and after the law introduction, regardless of the income, we see an upward shift in the probability of default. Okay, but now if we look where the effect was larger, we could see huge effects for the wealthy borrowers and less so for uh, uh, those with, uh, with the lowest income. So again, there's a strong interpretation that it might be the strategic behavior. Could be the wealth again linked with the financial literacy, we don't know this. Then we look at, let's say, a more precise measure of uh, in depth. That's fine. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm sure that a percentage of a percentage is the right way of, of reporting this. Um, well, we, mean, we, okay, so it gives the I wrong agree. impression. This two hundred and fifty percent. I mean, it's basically ten basis points in one case. The other one is thirteen basis points. Exactly. Case, so but, the numbers are small, indeed. But then you mean that it's an increase, but it's from a low level to a low level. It's not. It's not super large. 
But what, what I wanted to, to highlight here is, is the fact that we, we see this upward trend. So it's a, to substantiate more the idea if the law is there and the meaning or the purpose of the law was that those guys that will face stress will benefit is not exactly what is going on because apparently everybody wants to benefit. So this is what it wants to say. I, I agree with you, but looking at this without interpreting the economic significance might be a weaker way of argumenting. But um, yeah, this stage, um, yeah, what, what we could do more, we look at other measures, more and more clear measures of indebtedness, and we, we, we experience the same pattern. So when we look uh, here at what happened, uh, when we take into account all the debt obligations or debt service to income, Again, what we see in the marginal effects is an upward uh, uh, shift for all probability of defaults for all the borrowers, regardless in debtness. But again, uh, the, the biggest increase is experienced by those that are less in debt. Again, is an indication for strategic behavior. Then when we look at what happened with the, the loan characteristics, we are interested in this LTV. So remember, this is a current LTV. So we have a clear valuation of outstanding loan clear market valuation, so it's a current value. Uh, so we can interpret LTV larger than 100 as a negative equity. So basically you, you own more to the bank than your house is value. And again, what we can see here is a big jump exactly for those with negative equity. Again, we confirm what the literature already said and this happens in our, in our sample. And finally, we look at the amount of origination and we see that the biggest jump is precisely for those guys with a larger uh, amount, larger exposure. So if we put these results together, having evidence that a high income, low indebtedness, high current LTV, larger loans of uh, uh, origination lead to an increasing probability of default, we can argue that the law um, in the end was not beneficial only for debtors facing affordability problems, but also incentivize the opportunistic behavior of some borrowers to, uh, to default. Um, and uh, that's the main conclusion. With respect to the policy, well, there is only one recommendation. Don't introduce a law with retroactive applicability with clear eligibility criteria. So it's easy. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Rasman. I don't know if you have more comments or questions. Uh, I was wondering if you could exploit, um, continuing the discussion about the, the effect of the constitutional court ruling, whether you could exploit that the people who defaulted closer to the constitutional rule ruling, mm -hmm. court ruling, are different than the ones from that, uh, that defaulted at the beginning. Because it seems to suggest that the first, the people who first defaulted may have followed a strategic behavior, but maybe the people who defaulted at the end uh, were expecting yeah. to default in the near future or something. We are working on this. I didn't report it here, the robustness test. So we use the OLS, or as I said, we include the other types of mortgages, but also we are trying to, to answer exactly this question, the related question, but similar uh, using this course matching, looking at the characteristic of borrowers who defaulted when was introduced than before see whether they were different, and this explains their behavior. So, um, yeah, we are working on this, is a good suggestion. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, you presented many tables, and I'm not sure that I saw the one that I was uh, sort of thinking about, uh, which is whether uh, the those that defaulted, perhaps more or less, were uh, mortgages that originally were in Swiss francs or euros. Oh, we, we, we check for this. So indeed, uh, it matters a lot whether it's a foreign currency. So, so maybe this is the table uh, here. Um, here. So basically, this is the uh, euro and Swiss franc. So yeah, I didn't insist most of this because this will, will not support the, the, the main reason, the strategic aspect. And then we see that indeed, they are more significant compared, and the base category here is a domestic currency. So they are riskier than, and then they defaulted more. But you don't interact that with the DIS period. Yeah, I, I didn't report, but we, we have an exercise when we interact also with the DIS. With the, yeah. So I, I insist in the presentation only on those aspects that could explain, provide some explanation for strategic behavior. You're very right indeed. 
uh, the foreign currency loans were riskier. And indeed, in the period, the probability of default for those increased even more. I don't know if maybe I understood your, do I understand your question correctly? Because you want to see whether the default is driven only by those. No, to see whether they are indeed, they contribute. Yeah, so we, we, we control for this. So it's very interesting. Do you also do the results of comparing around the thresholds, people with right above, right below? Just uh, maybe I didn't understand the eligibility criteria, like with you know, 260 or 240 and see if it's... So threshold with respect to... $250,000, that, that threshold, can you use... 250. Ah. 250. Can you, you narrow down the sample to people in that neighborhood and see? Well, so what we can do is to include was also was the suggestion also these borrowers. Uh, we didn't do a robustness with them, so I said we we exclude them. Oh, no, but they didn't qualify actually. No, no. Now okay, I understand so your question. Yeah. They didn't qualify. So another robustness would be to add them with the first home loans to see whether the behavior changes. Yeah, but as I said, there are, there are very few um, uh, mortgages with that amount because the values at that moment, so I have it here, I think, um, is not so, uh, I have it here. Like, so you see the, what is the loan size at origination? So the mean is something like 50,000. So basically those uh, 250 far, far away, there are very few. The other question is more like a curiosity, just understand the, the, the magnitude. The, as I saw a paper that is a recent paper that just made that the US, where you know this, that the so only around six percent of the foes during the Great Recession were like strategic defaults. Did this, did this oh, it's paper by more. Pascal Noel and it's even more according to Peter Ganon. The ESO paper, the Journal of Finance, uh, is uh, close to 25 percent. And how can you, you can you back out? It's a similar thing you know, somehow. Ooh, ha, well, just to compare your as teachers because no. yeah, I see, it's not that see not different that estimates. So. But then again, keep in mind one thing, it's very important. So our sample and our investigation is after the global financial crisis. So we had the span of three years with incredibly large uh, defaults. Uh, still, at that moment it was quite impossible to be strategic because in Romania was a recourse law in force. Then we have the problem with the Swiss franc. And again, for like six months, many defaults because of this unpeg and increasing payment obligation. So we, we, we are far away for such a number, for such a number. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. One more time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raswan. And well, to, to end, to conclude, I would like to thank all of you, all the presenters, for being here. Uh, I personally enjoy a lot the presentations. I learn a lot from you, and, and, and I hope you, you, you feel the same. And I hope to, to, to see you again soon in this forum or in other forums and continue in touch. Also, a big thank you to the members of the organizer committee here represented by Rafa and Vicky, but particularly Rafa for the support and the commitment from the very, very beginning. Uh, if uh, this is a successful event, it's uh, because of you in particular, not me, as, as you mentioned. I am just <laughs> a, 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 another member of, of, of uh, the committee. So thank you very much for that. And last but not least, a big thank to all the uh, staff supporting this event, in particular, uh, Silvina, uh, who has uh, a, a great job, uh, Estefania, who is also over there, Gaston, so around now, I guess, uh, Chechis also, and all the members of the Beco team, and also Ezequiel and Rodrigo, that has supported us uh, uh, speaking in English <laughs> during two days. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much for your effort and, uh, and, and your work. So this uh, event concludes here. Thank you very much. And uh, again, uh, good uh, way back at home and stay in touch. Thank you.